Did the book of Joshua actually happen in real history? Are there myths that predate the book of Joshua that may have influenced the story, the narrative, the sun standing still, the battles of the Canaanites in conquering their land? Maybe from ancient Ugarit with the god El and a guy named Kurta or Karit? What about Agamemnon and Homeric epics when it comes to the Battle of Troy? Stay tuned. The archaeology comes first, then the mythology, and we give you our verdict. The Conquest of Canaan. Fact or Fiction? Archaeology and Origins of Israel. This section is entirely done using the wonderful work of Dr. Joshua Bowen from his excellent scholarly work, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. Volume 2. Be sure to grab a copy of his books, as they always get cutting-edge critical scholars in the field to address hot topics like the one in this video. He is one of the best scholars who takes very difficult topics and simplifies them for a general audience. So let's show him some love by getting his books and subscribing to his partner Megan Lewis's YouTube channel called Digital Hammurabi. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, Yahweh said to Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now get up and cross over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land that I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place upon which the soles of your feet tread, I have given to you, just as I said to Moses. The story of Joshua and the Israelite conquest of the Canaanites is perhaps one of the most well-known stories of the Old Testament. For those of us who are familiar with the evangelicalism practiced in much of the USA, the lyrics, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, 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 are probably not far removed from our minds. The conquest of Canaan rears its head in debates and discussions about the Old Testament time and again, primarily because of the implications that follow concerning the morality of Yahweh. How could an all-loving God command the genocide of an entire group of people? While this is an incredibly important question, our interest in this chapter is to ask a more basic question. Did these events even happen? If we read through the books of Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua, we see that the Israelites made their way through the wilderness and into the areas east of the Jordan River, conquering along the way. They ultimately crossed the western side of the Jordan, where they encounter famous Canaanite cities like Jericho and Ai, leaving destruction in their wake. But what can archaeology tell us about this story of the conquest? Did the Israelites actually come in mass into Canaan and inflict great destruction upon its inhabitants? Have archaeologists been able to confirm that these events took place as the Hebrew Bible describes? If there are problems and inconsistencies between the biblical story and that which we see in the archaeological and historical record, what are they? What do scholars now think? about the actual origins of ancient Israel. In this section, we will take a detailed look at the early origins of Israel and the land of Canaan. We will begin by reviewing the biblical narrative in order to clear about what the Old Testament says about how the Israelites came into the land. Following this, we will look into the problems with this narrative, specifically investigating what archaeologists have uncovered concerning several prominent sites that the Israelites were supposed to have destroyed. If the biblical narrative is not a reliable source of history for Israelite origins, then we must examine other sources of information that have led scholars to develop what is more likely scenario for early Israel. We will examine the evidence that we have for early Israelite culture and the models that have been constructed to explain the formation of the nation of Israel. The Old Testament Story of the Conquest Before we get into the archaeological evidence surrounding the formation of the nation of Israel, we need to know 
the story that the Old Testament tells concerning the Israelites' interest into the land of Canaan. Our primary interest in the story will be the individual cities or sites that the Israelites encamped at or engaged with following their wandering in the wilderness as they conquered the land of Canaan. Conquest of Transjordan East of the Jordan River You might recall that, following the exodus from Egypt, the children of Israel are commanded to go in and spy out the land of Canaan. However, because of their disbelief, God condemns them to wander through the wilderness until that unbelieving generation dies out, Numbers 13-14. We read in the book of Deuteronomy that following the death of his previous generation, God commands Moses to begin the journey north out of the wilderness toward Canaan, Deuteronomy 2, 1-3. Cook sums it up this way. Gone are the years of endless wandering in and around the hills of Edom, south of the Promised Land. The torch has now passed to the new generation. The Israelites request passage through the region of Edom to the south of Moab. However, the king of Edom refuses to let them pass. He amasses an army against the Israelites, and they are forced to take a longer route around the borders of Edom and into Canaan, Numbers 20, 14 through 21. As they move north into the Negev, the king of Arad attacks the Israelites. The people pray to Yahweh and are able to completely destroy the king of Arad's cities, changing the name to Harma, which means destruction. They then move south, east, stopping at Aboth and Aya Abaram, and cross the Wadi Zered and the Wadi Arnon. Once across the Arnon, the Israelites are commanded to attack the city of Heshbon, ruled by King Sihon, we read. Then Sihon went out to meet us, he and all his people, for battle to Jahaz. And Yahweh our God gave him over to us, and we smote him, his sons, and all his people. And we captured all his cities at that time, and we put every town under the ban, men, women, and children. We left no survivor. The city of Heshbon is destroyed, and Sihon's territory is conquered all the way south to the city of Dibon. We will return to these cities later in this section. The Israelites then turn to King Og and the city of Edre, in the area known as Bashan, farther to the north in Transjordan. They destroy him and his cities, as they had done to Sihon. The people then make their way to the plains of Moab, east of the Jordan River, and encamp opposite the city of Jericho, Numbers 22.1. It is here that the prophet Balaam is solicited by Balak, king of Moab, to pronounce curses against Israel, only to bless them on numerous occasions instead, Numbers 22-24. through 24. The Israelites also engage in illicit sexual activity with Midianite women, Numbers 25, bringing Yahweh's vengeance upon the Midianites in Numbers 31. Conquest of Cisjordan, west of the Jordan River. Following the death of Moses, the conquest of Canaan then moves across the Jordan River. Now, under the leadership of Joshua, the people approach the first major stronghold in the land, Jericho. This is a story that many of us know, perhaps by heart. In Joshua 6, the Israelites are instructed by Yahweh to march around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they are to march around the city walls seven times. Give a great shout and the walls will come down. The people carry out the command and the walls of the city indeed fall down. Jericho is completely dedicated to Yahweh, which means that nothing is allowed to be removed from it. They burn the city with everything still inside, except for Rahab, the prostitute, and her family. The city of Ai is their next target, and after some initial setbacks, Joshua 7, Joshua sets up an ambush and is able to take the city, setting it on fire. The text states that no survivors or fugitives are left alive, Joshua 8.22. Except for the king of Ai, they even chase after those that flee, men and women, and put them to the sword, Joshua 8.24-25. The city of Ai is then burned to the ground and turned into a desolate place, Joshua 8.28. After being tricked by the Gibeonites into making a peace treaty 
Joshua 9. The Israelites are faced with fighting off a coalition. We read, And Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Heron, and to Piram, king of Jarmuth, and to Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Devir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, so that we might strike Gibeon. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. As Israel has made a peace treaty with Gibeon, they are obligated to come to their aid. After routing the enemy coalition, they destroy cities of Makeda, Libna, Lachish, Eglon, Hebron, and Debir. Jabin, the king of Hazor, then amasses his own coalition against Joshua, including the kings of Maidan, Shimron, Ashaf, and others. Joshua 11, 1 through 5. God delivers the coalition into their hands, and Joshua leads the army up to Hazor, the head of all the kingdoms. Joshua 11, 10. They kill everyone and burn the city down. A summary of these campaigns and a list of the cities that are destroyed appears in Joshua 12, 7 through 24. To sum up, after leaving the wilderness towards the land of Canaan, the Israelites defeat several kings and cities before crossing over the Jordan River, most notably Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan. Upon crossing the Jordan, Joshua leads the people to destroy the cities of Jericho and Ai, followed by campaigns in the central hill country, the south, and finally in the north at Hazor. William Deaver writes concerning the latter Cisjordan conquest. A close reading of the pertinent texts yields the following picture. In the book of Joshua, and to some extent in Judges, some 37 sites in Canaan west of the Jordan are said to have been taken, that is, seized and presumably destroyed. Problems with the biblical conquest story. But what can we say about the historical reliability of the conquest accounts in the Pentateuch and the book of Joshua? Does the archaeological evidence support the biblical account? There are several avenues available to us to approach these questions, but we will primarily focus on two. Were the cities in the conquest narratives occupied at the time of their purported destruction? And is there archaeological evidence for such destruction in the requisite period at the individual sites? Although this will be a bit of a spoiler, I think it's important to let the reader know where this chapter is headed, primarily because archaeological data can be a little complex. In light of this, I would like to quote John J. Collins, who writes concerning the archaeology of the cities in the Conquest account. He observes... Of nearly 20 identifiable sites that were captured by Joshua or his immediate successors according to the biblical account, only two, Hazer and Bethel, have yielded archaeological evidence of destruction at the appropriate period. Notice that Collins is engaging with both questions in his summary, was there a city to be destroyed? And are there signs of such a destruction? Similarly, William G. Deaver writes, of the 31 sites the Bible says were taken by the Israelites, actual destructions have been found at only two or three, and these are not necessarily Israelite. Sites like Diban, Heshbon, Jericho, and Ai were not even occupied in the late 13th century BCE, when we now know that any Exodus conquest must be dated. Again, Deaver not only addresses whether a city was destroyed, but also if the city was even occupied during the period under investigation. We will follow the same line of inquiry, selecting several of the more important cities that are said to have been destroyed or captured in the biblical narrative. We will see if they were occupied at the time of the supposed conquest and whether they show signs of destruction in the archaeological record. More explicitly, we will follow a methodology that can be seen in Klein's work on the conquest. Let us concentrate, however, solely on the eight sites that the biblical account specifically states were either completely destroyed or burned, besieged and captured, or simply captured by the invading Israelites. Because if the account is true, we should be able to find archaeological evidence for the destruction and or capture of these sites.
As we expand our investigation to campaigns in Transjordan, the principle will be the same. We will evaluate the archaeological data from Arad and Dibon. And Jericho, I, Lachish, and Hazor in Cisjordan. We need to determine the time frame in which we should be looking for occupation and destruction in these cities. In other words, if we find that a city was occupied in 1500 BCE and destroyed at that time, it will only be meaningful to our discussion if the conquest happened in or around 1500 BCE. However, if the conquest is supposed to have happened closer to 1250 BCE, then the destruction of that city in 1500 BCE will provide no positive evidence for the conquest. In that light, when should we be looking for a conquest of Canaan by the Israelites? There are only a few scholars that maintain the traditional date for the Exodus and conquest narratives, which place those events in the second half of the 15th century, circa 1447 and 1407 BCE. Most scholars who argue for the general historical validity of the biblical accounts have otherwise moved away from such an early date. William Deaver writes, Today, all scholars, even most evangelicals, have abandoned that date. The few holdouts, neither mainstream biblicists nor archaeologists, can safely be ignored. The only feasible date for the early Israelite settlement in Canaan is circa 1250 or 1150. This position can be seen in the work of James Hoffmeyer, an evangelical Egyptologist who has written extensively on the Exodus. He notes, Considering that the construction of Pi Rameses began under Seti I and was completed by Rameses II, circa 1294 and 1260 BC, and that Merneptah's Asiatic campaign falls circa 1208 BC, 1270, 1240 BC seems like a plausible window of time for the Exodus. These construction projects and the first mention of Israel in Canaan bracket a period of time in which the Exodus could have taken place. They were in Egypt long enough to do the building, but they had to be in Canaan by the end of the 13th century. If the Exodus took place sometime between 1270 and 1240 BCE, this would result in the conquest account occurring at the end of the 13th century, at some point between 1230 and 1200 BCE. And it is the archaeological evidence, as we will see in this chapter, that has moved theories regarding the date of the Exodus or conquest forward several centuries. Lawrence T. Garrity argues, it is primarily the archaeological evidence from excavated Palestinian sites that has been used to bolster the current scholarly consensus that if there was an Israelite exodus from Egypt, it must have occurred sometime in the 13th century BCE. Conquered sites in the Negev and Transjordan. Before the Israelites cross over the Jordan River, they fight three major battles in the region of the Negev and Transjordan to the east of the Jordan. The first is against the king of Ered, followed by battles against Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan. Among the cities that are mentioned in the narrative, three stand out as significant for this discussion. And Dibon, or Dibon. Whether one believes the conquest to have occurred in the late 15th century BCE or in the 13th century BCE, we would expect to find an occupied city at these sites during the Late Bronze Age, circa 1500 to 1200 BCE. Is this what we find when we view the archaeological data? Let's begin our investigation with the fortified city of Arad in the Negev. The site was excavated in the mid-1960s for five dig seasons and for an additional 13 seasons in the 1970s and early 80s. During the first seasons, the areas of excavation were distributed throughout the site in order to determine its extent, nature, and stratigraphy. That is, the excavators selected their areas to dig in such a way that they would understand the overall layout placement of the buildings and stratigraphic nature. Of the site. 
In the course of their excavations, they determined that there were five individual strata that dated to the third millennium, strata one through five. There was a break in occupation at the site following these levels, after which a new city was established. The first settlement apparently dates to the late 12th to the early 11th centuries BCE. Thus, there was no occupation at Arad, no city to be destroyed from the third millennium until the late 12th century, early 11th century, passing over the all too important late Bronze Age. Of course, this gap of nearly 1500 years between the third millennium strata and those that follow in the 12th century presents a problem for the biblical narrative, where we would expect to see a significant occupation during the late Bronze Age, circa 1500 to 1200 BCE. There is nothing. Indeed, Israel Finkelstein and Neil Silberman write, Almost 20 years of intensive excavations at the site of Tel Arad, east of Beersheba, have revealed remains of a great early Bronze Age city, about 25 acres in size, and an Iron Age fort. But no remains whatsoever from the late Bronze Age, when the place was apparently deserted. The same holds true for the entire Beersheba Valley. Arad simply did not exist in the Late Bronze Age. We next turn our attention to the city of Heshbon, which is located at modern-day Tel Hasban. The site was excavated from 1968 until 1976. Garrity writes, Six seasons of excavations have been carried out at Tel Hasban, the first five by the Andrews University, Berrien Springs, Michigan, and the last by the Baptist Bible College, Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. It is worth noting that these excavations were undertaken by Christian institutions. There were four areas in which the archaeologists excavated. They labeled them areas A through D, and they dug down until they reached virgin soil, ground that had not been disturbed by human activity. Garrity, one of the excavators, notes that they found 19 different occupation layers on the site. Stratum 19 was dated to the 12th through 11th centuries BCE and contained a small village that was not protected by a defensive wall. In other words, at the time that the Israelites purportedly destroyed Heshbon, the Late Bronze Age, archaeologists have determined that no city was even yet in existence at the site. In fact, in the early Iron Age, from which we do find material remains, the evidence shows that it was not a major city, but a simply small, unfortified village. Archaeologists have had to reckon with this data, which stand in contradiction to the biblical narrative. William Deva writes, The account of the destruction of Heshbon in Numbers 21-21-32, the seat of Sihon, king of the Amorites, is extremely difficult to synthesize with archaeological evidence. This was perhaps particularly challenging for the excavators at the site, given their religious affiliations and commitments. Nevertheless, as Deva notes, the excavators resolutely published their results, however, and reluctantly conceded that something was drastically wrong with the biblical story about Heshbon. With serious problems at the excavations of Arad and Heshbon, how would the city of Dibon fare? In short, Numbers 21, 27 through 30 recounts a poem about the destruction of Heshbon and King Sihon, in which his kingdom is destroyed down to the city of Dibon. The modern city of Dibon stands next to the site of biblical Dibon. Tushingham explains, The location of the site of ancient Dibon was first established by its similarity to the name of the modern Arab village. Its identity was subsequently confirmed in 1868 by the discovery on the site of the Mesha Stela. There were excavations at the site during the 1950s and 60s, revealing occupation layers dating back to the early Bronze Age. However, as with Arad, there is a break in occupation following the early Bronze Age. After an apparent gap in occupation, there is important evidence for Moabite occupation possibly as early as Iron Age 1, on the summit of the mound. 
Similar results came from other parts of the site, which show that the city was reoccupied no earlier than Iron Age I, and more significantly from the middle of the 9th century BCE. On these data, combined with what we saw from Heshbon above, led Deaver to conclude. Several of the sites or encampments in Transjordan can perhaps be identified. Among them are Biblical Dibon, Arabic Dibon, the capital of Moab, and Heshbon, Arabic Hesban. Both have been excavated by conservative biblical scholars, motivated to confirm the biblical accounts of Israelite destructions. Num 21-21-32. But neither site was occupied in the requisite mid to late 13th century. There are a few 12th and 11th century sherds, but there is no architecture. These sites became towns only in the 9th century, the earliest. Conquered sites in Cisjordan. If the cities that the Israelites were purported to have conquered in the Negev and Transjordan were not occupied at the time of the supposed conquest in the Late Bronze Age, what of the cities to the west of the Jordan River? Do the famous cities of Jericho, Ai, Lachish, and Hazor fall into the same unoccupied during the Late Bronze Age category? If not, do the Late Bronze Age remains allow us to speak of a destruction that can or should be attributed attributed to the invading Israelites. Before we move into the archaeological data, I would like to explain why I have chosen these four sites for closer consideration. The first two sites, Jericho and Ai, are the first to be destroyed in the conquest of Cisjordan and are incredibly well known and significant to the narrative, with several chapters dedicated to them in the Old Testament. While perhaps not as well known, destructions at both Lachish and Hezor are also important to the story. However, there is a far more significant reason for investigating the archaeological remains of these sites. They were said to have been destroyed, burned, and or suffered a total defeat. Such significant destruction should be identifiable in the archaeological record, making these four sites obvious and natural test cases. Jericho, Tel Es Sultan the, the site of Tel Es Sultan was identified from very early on with Biblical Jericho. This connection was definitely established by E. Robinson and E. Smith in 1841. Much of the site was damaged by early excavation techniques, often making the data difficult to interpret. Although Charles Warren excavated at Jericho in 1868, he determined that there was nothing to be found at the site. However, in the early 20th century, 1907 to 1909, we see the first significant excavations at the site performed by Ernst Sellen and Karl Watzinger. They apparently made some errors with Jericho's chronology. Lorenzo Nigro writes, The Austro-German expedition produced a detailed report, but adopted a wrong chronology. They attributed the Middle Bronze fortifications to the Israelites and the early bronze city walls to the Canaanite city conquered by Joshua. John Garstang launched the next series of excavations at Jericho between 1930 and 1936, in which he determined that the city was destroyed around 1400 BCE. Go figure. This conclusion was challenged by Kathleen Kenyon, who went back through Garstang's data in order to determine if the destruction actually took place during the Late Bronze Age. She concluded, contrary to Garstang's interpretation, the walls of the city had not collapsed in 1400, but rather 1,000 years earlier, circa 2400 BCE. J.P. Dessel states her position. Jericho had not been inhabited in 1400 BCE, and there were only slight remains during the following century, 1400 to 1300 BCE. This is an important point to which we will return soon. Excavations were taken up again at the site beginning in 1997 by the Italian-Palestinian Archaeological Expedition to Tel Es Sultan, a joint pilot project carried on by Sapienza University of Rome and the Department of Archaeology and Cultural Heritage of the Palestinian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. Over 11 dig seasons from 1997 to 2015, with work continuing to the present, not only were new areas excavated, but the previous data were also 
also re-examined with respect to the dating and occupation of the site, primarily focusing on the Bronze and Iron Ages. Lorenzo Nigro explains the complexity of excavating at the site in this way. The archaeology of Jericho poses a multifaceted challenge. The history of the site, its archaeological exploration, and its worldwide fame are firmly connected to its biblical mention in the conquest narrative of the Book of Joshua, Joshua 2.6, making it an icon of biblical archaeology. Before we dig down into the details of the excavations and the stratigraphy, occupation history of the site, let's remind ourselves of what we are looking for. The primary issue is whether the city of Jericho was occupied during the Late Bronze Age, and if so, whether it would have been the mighty fortified city that is described in the biblical narrative. In other words, if we assume that Joshua and the Israelites crossed the Jordan and approached the city of Jericho, would they have encountered a walled and formidable city to be conquered? The city of Jericho dates back into the Mesolithic period, 10,500 to 9,000 BCE, Stratum Sultan Zero, making it one of the oldest continuously occupied, with few exceptions, cities on Earth. There was an influx of new inhabitants during the late 4th millennium BCE, Stratum Sultan 3A, which eventually transformed Jericho into an urban center. Nigro notes, At the beginning of the 3rd millennium, early Bronze II, Sultan the Tribe, with the erection of a massive city wall and the enucleating of a public area on the central mound facing the spring and overlooking the whole oasis, Jericho became a real city. The city wall of early Bronze II, 3000 to 2800 BCE, Sultan 3B, which was made with more than 2,000 bricks, had a twofold purpose, to delimit the place where public functions and wealth were gathered and protected, and to dominate the oasis as a visible symbol of the new urban power. In spite of its massive size, the early Bronze II city was destroyed circa 2700 BCE by a severe earthquake. So during the early 3rd millennium BCE, Jericho became an urban center surrounded by a sizable city wall, but was ultimately destroyed by an earthquake. Following the earthquake, the city saw a significant rebuilding in early Bronze III, 2800 to 2250 BCE, Sultan III C, including an expansion in size of the city wall. Nigro describes this massive fortification. The city walls were doubled, and the 13.1 FT 4M wide space in between the inner and outer walls, built of mud bricks on stone foundations, was kept free for pathways or storerooms, or filled up with crushed limestone in order to strengthen the fortifications. Wooden beams and reeds served as chains and draining devices within the mud brick structures. Such an impressive work remained for millennia, a distinctive emerging feature of Tel Sultan, possibly inspiring the biblical author of the Joshua account. This fortified city was not to last indefinitely. However, as it suffered a destructive fire at the end of the third millennium BCE, Around 2350, BC Palace G suffered a violent conflagration. It was intentionally set on fire and burning ceilings collapsed, smashing items and vessels on the floor. Its destruction marked the end of the urban early Bronze Age at Jericho. This fortified city was not to last indefinitely as it suffered a destructive fire at the end of the third millennium. After a brief intermediate period, a new city was established at Jericho in the beginning of the second millennium. During this Middle Bronze period, 1950 to 1550 BCE, the city was protected by fortifications, although it suffered destructions on several subsequent occasions. In short, during the early third millennium, there was an urban center with a wall. That city was destroyed and rebuilt with an even bigger wall. At the end of the third millennium, the rebuilt city was destroyed, only to be rebuilt again again at the beginning of the second millennium. Throughout the first half of the second millennium, Jericho was destroyed and rebuilt multiple times. This brings us to the all too important Late Bronze Age. Remember Garstang had concluded that the remains of a destroyed city wall dated to around 1400 BCE? A view that was later challenged by Kenyon. In 1986, Piotr Binkowski published a study of the Late Bronze Age finds from Jericho. He summarized the purpose of his book in this way. 
Much argument has raged over the interpretation of the LBA, Late Bronze Age. Levels at Jericho because of its role in the Old Testament. Every archaeologist working there has searched for the walls which fell down flat before Joshua and the Israelites. The published evidence has been interpreted in all sorts of ways to accommodate different viewpoints. The present study is essentially an examination of the published and unpublished LBA material from Garstang's excavations, which is crucial for our knowledge of Jericho's history. He analyzed two sources of Late Bronze Age material culture found at Jericho, buildings and tombs. Let's briefly overview his argument and conclusions as they pertain to our discussion. A seven-room building was excavated by Garstang, a structure that came to be known as the Middle Building. Because it stood in apparent isolation between the Middle Bronze Age and Iron Age levels. When the structure was excavated, Garstang found a layer of burnt debris below the building, which he referred to as the streak. Although there was debate between Garstang and Kenyon concerning the middle building and its dating, Piotr Binkowski concludes, The streak has been shown to date probably to the end of the Middle Bronze Age. The middle building, which overlies the streak, was associated with LBI, early LBIIB pottery. There seems to be no alternative but to date the middle building to LBII, early LBIIB, C, 14th, 13th centuries, BC. So this middle building is most likely to be associated with the Late Bronze Age, dating to sometime in the late 14th and early 13th centuries BCE. It appears that the extent of overall occupation during the Late Bronze Age was rather minimal. The excavators found evidence of erosion having taken place at the site, and it was thought that because there was erosion in different periods, this might explain the lack of Late Bronze Age material culture. In other words, it was theorized that there was no Late Bronze Age remains because those portions of the site had eroded away. Against this, Binkowski concluded. In the total absence of any LB erosion debris, though, it seems extremely unlikely that LB occupation at Jericho extended much further than the middle building area. Because he would expect some washed away Late Bronze Age remains to show up on the site, the fact that this debris does not appear led Binkowski to posit that it was not there in the first place. In short, there does not appear to be any extensive Late Bronze Age occupation at Jericho. There was a building, the middle building, that had some limited associated remains. But given the scarcity of either in situ, on site, remains, or erosion debris, it seems as though the occupation was quite limited, particularly to the area around the middle building. But the question on everyone's mind is, what about the walls? Remember, Joshua and the Israelites brought down the mighty defensive walls of Jericho. Is there evidence of a defensive wall during the Late Bronze Age? Garstang identified the remains of a defensive wall that he dated to the Late Bronze Age. However, upon closer inspection, Kenyon determined that this wall was actually to be dated much earlier, to the Early Bronze Age. Kenyon writes, of the defenses of the period, nothing at all survives. The double wall ascribed to the Late Bronze Age in the 1930-1936 excavations is composed in part of two successive walls form the Early Bronze Age. For most of the circuit, only stumps survive. Even of these walls and of the Middle Bronze Age, glaciers that buried them, only the part on the slopes of the mound was intact. There is not the slightest trace of any later wall. Kenyon's conclusion that there was no Late Bronze Age fortifications, including a defensive wall, has been maintained by later archaeologists. Binkowski, for example, concludes, It appears extremely unlikely that there are any town walls at Jericho, which could date to the Late Bronze Age. The actual area of occupation in this period seems to have been limited to the area around the middle building. Similarly, Lorenzo Nigro writes, No evidence of a fortification system for this period existed, and Garstang's Wall of City D was a wrong attribution to the late bronze of the early Bronze III double city wall. So there appears to have been a minimal amount of Late Bronze Age occupation on the site and no defensive wall. Does this picture fit well with what we know of sites that existed throughout the rest of Canaan during the Late Bronze Age? Binkowski says it that it does. 
Study of the settlement pattern of the LBA in Canaan shows that in the 14th century BC, 37% of known settlements were less than one hectare in size. Furthermore, only eight out of 76 known LBA settlements in the whole of Canaan were fortified, and all but one of these were larger than one hectare. The vast majority of settlements were not fortified. It would seem, therefore, that a tiny unwalled Jericho fits the pattern in LB Canaan extremely well. The most recent excavators agree. This is, of course, fairly normal since the majority of sites in Palestine are devoid of a new fortification system in this period, after having been submitted to Egyptian 18th dynasty control. In fact, it appears that Jericho was abandoned around 1275 BCE, remaining that way until sometime in the 11th century BCE. Of course, these conclusions concerning Jericho represent the consensus view among archaeologists and biblical scholars. Deaver, for example, writes, Kenyon, however, equipped with far superior modern methods, showed beyond doubt that in the mid-late 13th century, BC, the time period now required for any Israelite conquest, Jericho lay completely abandoned. There is not so much as a late bronze tomb potsherd of that period on the entire site. Eric H. Klein agrees. Kenyon's excavations therefore implied that if Joshua and the Israelites had invaded Canaan during the Middle or Late Bronze Age, between 1550 BC and 1200 BC, they would have found Jericho almost totally, if not completely, deserted, and without any of its vaunted fortifications still present. Finally, Finkelstein and Silberman conclude... In the case of Jericho, there was no trace of a settlement of any kind in the 13th century BCE, and the earlier Late Bronze settlement, dating to the 14th century BCE, was small and poor, almost insignificant and unfortified. There was also no sign of a destruction. Why, then, might the story of Jericho have developed? We saw above that Lorenzo Nigro suggests that the earlier massive fortifications and the ruins that remained may have influenced the later story. He writes, The ruins of Teles Sultan include massive collapsed and burnt mud brick structures. One may imagine that the terrible destruction suffered by the Canaanite city both in the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC had surely become part of the local shared memory and possibly were narrated as the Jerichoans had been able to overcome them almost every time. There is no way, however, to link them directly to the Bible, except for the fact that the biblical author may have reused one of these stories to validate the historicity of his narration. The already famous ruins of Jericho were exploited by the biblical author, giving them an everlasting fame. In summation, when we consider the city of Jericho that the Israelites would have encountered in the Late Bronze Age, whether at the end of the 15th century, the more traditional day, or in the mid to late 13th century, what is the picture that the archaeological data paint for us? First, there is a clear lack of significant occupation during the Late Bronze Age, which is followed by an abandonment of the site at some point during the 13th century. Not only were there no massive walls and fortifications, there appears to have been no wall at all during the Late Bronze Age. In short, the city of Jericho that Joshua would have encountered was either small, a small unwalled village, or even an altogether abandoned site. Neither scenario accords with the biblical account. I et tell. Following the defeat of the city of Jericho, the book of Joshua reports, And Joshua burned I and made it a ruin mound forever, a desolation, until this very day. The city of Ai has been identified as the site Et-Tel, which means ruins, appropriately the same word for ruin mound used in Joshua 8.28. Klein writes, The ancient city of Ai has been identified with the site of Et-Tel ever since the days of the early explorer Edward Robinson in 1838. This identification has not gone unchallenged by some evangelical scholars, but this will be addressed soon. 
The site of Etel has occupation layers that date back into the late 4th millennium BCE and has been excavated by several archaeological teams. The nearly 28-acre mound was first sounded by Garstang, by now a familiar name, in 1928. He dug eight trenches in different areas of the Tel. Along the southern and western parts of the early Bronze Age city, from 1933 to 1935, three dig seasons were completed by J. Marquest Cross. These excavations uncovered strata from the early Bronze Age and Iron Ages. In one area of the site, it was clear that the early Bronze Age remains were immediately followed by Iron Age strata, with no intervening late Bronze Age occupation. The final round of excavations did not occur until three decades later, from 1964 to 1972, directed by Joseph Calloway. Before we continue, I should provide a bit of background information on Joseph Calloway, a graduate of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Louisville, Kentucky. Calloway was first exposed to excavating in 1960 by G. Ernest Wright at the city of Shechem. If you recall from Volume 1 of Dr. Joshua Bowen's book, that Wright was a conservative scholar who strongly advocated for the historical veracity of the stories in the Hebrew Bible. Calloway went on to study with Kathleen Kenyon and ultimately found himself excavating at the city of Ai. We should bear in mind that as with other sites that we have investigated, archaeological evidence that points away from the historical validity of the conquest account may be met with resistance by a scholar like Calloway. Calloway lists the stratigraphic layers from Etel as follows. You can see the chart. The most important thing to recognize in this chart is the bolded text is the sizable gap in the stratigraphic layers from the early Bronze Age, 3rd millennium BCE. In other words, at the time that the Israelites were said to have conquered this fortified city, the late Bronze Age, it appears that the city was either unoccupied or had only very recently been occupied. It is only at the end of the late Bronze Age, if we take Callaway's dating of 1220 BCE, that a settlement is reestablished on the site. More on this in a minute. For now, Let's walk through the occupation layers that the excavators uncovered. The earliest occupation comes from the end of the 4th millennium BCE and consisted of a village without fortifications, perhaps a century later. A planned walled city enclosing 27.5a was constructed. The city was destroyed in 2860 BCE and subsequently rebuilt, only to be destroyed again at the end of the 28th century. The early Bronze Three Strata also shows fortifications, which last for over 300 years. Nevertheless, as Calloway writes, Violent destruction overtook the city in about 2400 BCE. The site then stayed in ruins for over a millennium. The site of Ai was abandoned and left in ruins after its destruction in about 2400 BCE until about 1220 BCE at the beginning of the Iron Age. Except for some possible transitory occupation during the early to mid-2nd millennium BCE, the site was apparently completely deserted for over a thousand years. Again, the break in occupation through the Middle and Late Bronze Ages is particularly troublesome for the biblical account of the conquest. Finkelstein explains, I was uninhabited from the end of E.B. Thra, circa 2400 BCE, until the beginning of the Iron Age, a fact which naturally has far-reaching implications for evaluating the biblical conquest traditions. Similarly, Klein notes, But I was destroyed and abandoned by 2400 BC, more than a thousand years before the Israelites could have possibly been in the region. A new city did not rise upon the ruins at Etel, until around 1200 BC. What did Calloway make of this discrepancy between the biblical text and the archaeological data? Initially, it appears that he attempted to provide a workable solution to the problem. Finkelstein writes that in 1968, Calloway solved the problem of the contradiction between the biblical narrative, the conquest of I, and the archaeological evidence, the absence of late bronze remains. The inhabitants of the first phase were not Israelites, but perhaps Hivites. 
and the conquest of Ai was simply the takeover of this village by Israelites, who then became the occupants of the site in the second phase. Ultimately, however, it appears that Calloway resigned himself to the reality of the discrepancy between the text and the archaeological data. As Deaver notes, Calloway put it this way in 1985, for many years, the primary source for the understanding of the settlement of the first Israelites was the Hebrew Bible. But every reconstruction based upon the biblical traditions has floundered on the evidence from archaeological remains. Now, the primary source has to be the archaeological remains. In fact, it appears that Calloway took early retirement from his very conservative seminary rather than risk being the cause of theological embarrassment. Before we conclude this section, let's take a look at some of the challenges that have been put forth concerning the identification of biblical I with Etel. Deaver writes concerning this potential misidentification. A few other scholars, mostly fundamentalists, tried another tactic to save, destroy, I. They insisted that the story of destruction was really about Canaanite Bethel, only about two miles distant, which does have a destruction level dating to K.A. 1200 B.C. The story got displaced to Bethel by mistake, since I, the ruin heap, as its name means, must have been so obvious that some site got destroyed. Other scholars attempt to locate biblical I somewhere else, which is unlikely since the ruin is obviously the mound discussed here, still prominent today. One such conservative scholar is Bryant Wood. Klein notes, Bryant Wood has been conducting excavations since 1995 at the nearby site of Kerbet el Makatia, just one mile from Et Tel. There, he claims to have found evidence of both occupation and destruction dating to the 15th century BC, which he attributes to Joshua and the invading Israelites. As we have seen, this is a fringe position. But not only with respect to the date of the conquest in the 15th century BCE, the same holds true for the identification of the site of Ai, much of the same with Calloway's original solution to the conquest problem. Finkelstein's words could equally apply to Wood. He obviously arrived at this strange solution in a desperate attempt to find some way to accommodate the biblical narrative with the archaeological evidence. This general tendency to privilege the biblical accounts can even be seen in the works of James Hofmeyer. He writes, Some have suggested that the lack of any late Bronze Age cultural remains simply indicates that the site of Etel is not biblical I. Site identification is one of the most challenging tasks for an archaeologist. Other sites have been proposed for I, so we will have to see where further evidence leads. In the same section, Hofmeyer argues that the Late Bronze Age remains of Jericho uh, were probably washed away. One reason for the limited data is that this city was unoccupied for several centuries. Exposure to the elements, rain and wind, resulted in considerable erosion. Thus, little can be said about the Late Bronze Age settlement. Again, while these conclusions are possible, a misidentified eye, Late Bronze Age remains eroded away from Jericho, these do not represent the views of the majority of specialists in the field and certainly appear to be motivated by a theological commitment to the biblical texts. Let's see if we can sum up what we've learned about the city of Ai in this section. First, except for a few conservative outliers, the scholarly consensus is that the biblical city of Ai should be identified with the site of Et Tel. Second, it is clear that there are several occupation layers that date to the late 4th millennium and most of the 3rd millennium BCE. However, following a destruction of the city around 2400 BCE, the Tel was abandoned until around 1200 BCE. Third, the early bronze city had significant fortifications that were destroyed, while the new village that was established around 1200 BCE had no fortifications, quite similar to the other sites in the southern Levant at the time. All of this leads to the same conclusion that we have seen up to this point. If the Israelites entered the land of Canaan for conquest, either in the late 15th century or in the late 13th century BCE, there would have been no fortified city for them to conquer. This is consistent with the Arad in the Negev, the Transjordan sites of Heshbon and Debir, and the Cisjordan sites of Jericho and Ai. We now turn to two final Cisjordan sites that may tell a different 
different story, Lachish and Hazor. Lachish. As with Jericho and I, in Joshua 10, the Israelites fight against several cities that are subjected to destruction, including Lachish. Joshua 10, 31 through 34. The site of Tel Lachish, located in the area known as the Shephila, was approximately 31 acres in area. Although the site, Tel El Hesi, was earlier identified as Lachish, there has been general consensus that Tel Lachish is the correct identification since 1929, when Albert first made the connection. The first significant excavations were performed between 1932 and 1938, directed by John Starkey. Several decades later, in the late 1960s, Yohanan Aharani excavated Lachish. David Usishkin notes that during Aharani's dig seasons, various late bronze and Iron Age remains were uncovered. Beginning in 1973, David Usishkin began his work at the site. Excavations ran until 1994. Most recently, a fourth round of excavations has run from 2013 to 2017. Under the co-direction of Josef Garfinkel, Michael G. Hazel, and Martin G. Klingbeil. During the Early Bronze 1 and 2, there was limited occupation at the site. In Early Bronze 3, the occupation expanded, possibly covering the entire mound. It appears that the Early Bronze 3 settlement included fortifications and, like many other sites, was destroyed or abandoned at the end of the Early Bronze period. The city was reoccupied during the Middle Bronze Age, complete with fortifications, as you might expect. It suffered a destruction that probably concurred with the destruction of other great contemporary cities, such as Jericho and Shechem. We now turn to the Late Bronze Age remains. What kind of occupation is seen at the site during this period? And did it suffer a destruction similar to the one described in the Hebrew Bible? Ushiskin writes, Following the destruction of the Middle Bronze City, the settlement recovered slowly, becoming again a large and important city-state in the 14th century, reaching its zenith in the 12th century BCE. This seems promising for the biblical narrative. The site was occupied in the 14th century and greatly increased in size in the 12th century BCE. There was a large Canaanite temple, the so-called Fossi Temple, that was excavated by Starkey. It was rebuilt two times and can be associated at different times with different strata, Fossi temples 1 through 3. The last phase of this temple, Fossi Temple 3, was destroyed at about 1200 BCE at the end of Stratum 7. Another Canaanite-style temple designated the Acropolis Temple was constructed in Stratum 6, Canaanite occupation that would ultimately be destroyed by a fire around 1130 BCE. Usishkin notes, Following the fearful destruction, the site was abandoned during the Iron Eye period. Surveys indicated that the settlements in the surrounding region also ceased to exist at that time. Let's take a second to review. First, there was occupation at the site of Lachish during the Early and Middle Bronze Ages, as well as in the Late Bronze Age. This Canaanite occupation suffered a destruction around 1200 BCE, but it remained a Canaanite city until Lachish was completely destroyed around 1130 BCE. In other words, following Level 7 destruction and subsequent Level 6 rebuilding, Lachish remained a Canaanite city. It did not become an Israelite one. There are some obvious problems with this data when it comes to the biblical story. First, although we have a late Bronze Age destruction at a time that might work for the commonly accepted later date of the conquest, sometime around 1200 BCE, the new city that was rebuilt was not an Israelite occupation. It continued to be Canaanite. Klein states the problem in this way. But evidence shows that the site was reoccupied instantly and the Canaanite city of level 6 quickly flourished, only to be destroyed about 1150 BC. If the Israelites had caused the destruction of level 7 at Lachish, we would expect the city of level 6 to exhibit characteristics of an Israelite settlement, rather than a Canaanite settlement. Secondly, if we assume that the second destruction of Lachish represents the handiwork of the conquering Israelites under Joshua, we would have to conclude that even the late date for the conquest is not late enough. Deva writes, 
Albright and others were once fond of citing the massive Late Bronze Age destruction of Lachish as evidence to support the biblical narrative, after which it was abandoned for as long as two centuries. Albright dated the relevant destruction to CA 1225 BC, but large-scale excavations carried out by Israeli archaeologists in 1973-87 have proven that the destruction in question took place perhaps as late as 1170 BC. That is, some 50 years too late for our commander, in chief Joshua. In a similar vein, Klein writes, it is now clear that the Canaanite city of Lachish was destroyed at least half a century later than anyone previously thought, at about 1150 BC rather than 1210. BC, or even 1410 BC, the destruction of Lachish is unlikely to be the result of a conquest by Joshua and his army of Israelites. What are we to make of these two destructions? Who brought down the Stratum 7 city? Who destroyed the city in Stratum 6? While it was likely not the Israelites, Klein remains cautiously non-committal about the perpetrators. It is unclear who destroyed Lachish the Six or the earlier city of Lachish Seventh. Both or neither could have been devastated by the Sea Peoples or by someone or something else entirely. In short, we don't know who destroyed Lachish, but it almost certainly wasn't Joshua and the invading Israelites. Hazor. Our last site under investigation will be Tel Hazor. The head of all those kingdoms. Of all the sites that have been excavated in the search to support the historical validity of the conquest account in the Hebrew Bible, this may be the site that comes the closest to aligning with the text. As we have done in the preceding discussion, Hazor will be examined to see if the occupation layers from the Late Bronze Age appear to align with what the Bible records Joshua doing to the city. Outside of the Hebrew Bible, the city of Hazor appears in text from both Beginning in the early 2nd millennium BCE, Amnon bin Tor writes, Hazor is first mentioned in the Egyptian execration texts from the 19th or 18th century BCE. It is the only Canaanite city mentioned, together with Laishdan, in the Mari documents of the 18th century BCE. That point to Hazor, having been one of the major commercial centers in the Fertile Crescent. We also see Hazor in the famous Amarna tablets, which depicted as an important city in Canaan during the period. Hazor is situated north of the Sea of Galilee and, given its designation in Joshua 11, it was a significant city in the biblical narrative. It sits on a branch of the Way of the Sea via Maris Road, one of the major highways through the region, positioned as a central control point. The site itself is divided into two parts, the upper city and the lower city. Garstang, again, was the first to sound the site in 1928. He spent three weeks at Hazor. Excavations began again in the 1950s under the direction of Yigel Yadin, with dig seasons running from 1955 to 1958, four seasons, and a final dig year in 1968. Several decades later in the 1990s, Amnon bin Tor went back to Hazor. He writes, Since 1990, excavations have been conducted every year under the direction of this writer, and from 2006 under joint direction with Sharon Zuckerman of the Institute of Archaeology of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem until her untimely death in 2014. Zuckerman provides a useful chart showing the various strata and their relationships to one another on the upper and lower city. For our purposes, the most salient or strata are listed below. Although this part of her chart only displays some of the Middle Bronze and Late Bronze Ages, Zuckerman explains, Hazer has one of the longest sequences of settlement in the southern Levant, having witnessed almost continuous settlement from the middle of the third millennium BCE, early Bronze Age the Thrach, until the late first millennium BCE, Hellenistic period. The early Bronze III, 2800 to 2250 BCE, settlement was an urban area. This period was followed by either a destruction or abandonment of the site. We don't know which. 
and a smaller, more rural occupation during the Middle Bronze I, 2250 to 1950 BCE, during the third and early second millennium. Occupation at the site was restricted to the upper city. This changed during Middle Bronze II, 1950 to 1550 BCE, as a new chapter in the history of Hazor began. Both the upper city and lower city were occupied and showed signs of great prosperity. This brings us to the Late Bronze Age levels, 1550 to 1200 BCE. Given the city's significance during the Amarna period, the material culture reflects a time of wealth and prosperity. The situation was not to last, however, as Zuckerman explains. Stratum Thawanthi, in the lower city, the last phase of Canaanite. Hazor is marked by decline and deterioration in all aspects of material culture. The gates went out of use, leaving the city unfortified. All public structures came to a violent end, with evidence of fierce conflagration and severe destruction clearly visible. The extent of the destruction is noteworthy. Bentor states, Hazor in its entirety went up in flames, in a destruction that could perhaps be described as the mother of all destruction because of the intensity of the conflagration. The intensity of the fire, apparently made so ferocious because of the wood used in the building construction, olive oil in storage in the buildings, and the strength of the wind at the site, resulted in a thick layer of destruction in places 2-3 meters thick, containing ash, burnt bricks, and wooden beams. In addition to the fire, there were also discovered remains of defaced statues and other signs of general intentional desecration. When was the last phase of Canaanite occupation at the city destroyed? This is the first important question for our purposes, and it is one that remains unsettled. Zuckerman writes, Canaanite Hazer was destroyed sometime during the 13th century BCE. More precise dating, whether in the first or second half of the century, is still debated. Yadin examined the pottery that was excavated from the burn layer, dating the destruction to approximately 1230 BCE. Bentor, in his renewed excavations, amended this dating based on the presence of fragments of an offering table with an Egyptian inscription of one of Ramesses the second's officials. On the basis of this, he concludes that the destruction did not occur before the middle of the 13th century BCE. If the city was destroyed sometime in the 13th century BCE, this is clearly problematic for the traditional date of 1407 BCE, but could fit well with the late date, unless it occurred closer to the middle of the 13th century. But does the material culture suggest that the Israelites were responsible for this destruction at Hazor? Let's see. The first question that we need to ask is, who occupied the city after this destruction of the last phase of Canaanite occupation? Given the biblical narrative, we would expect the material culture to show the city being occupied by Israelites. This is what we find. Complicating matters, however, is the fact that following the late bronze destruction of the Canaanite city, Hazor was left abandoned for nearly 200 years, Bentor writes. For almost two centuries, the site where the Bronze Age city of Hazor had once stood remained derelict until it was resettled in the mid-11th century BCE. Even then, only part of the upper city was resettled, with the lower city remaining forever abandoned. Perhaps it could be suggested that the Israelites destroyed Hazor and left it abandoned for these two centuries before taking up residency there. Bentor takes another approach to the question, asking, who was in the region that could have destroyed Hazor? And what does the material culture suggest about the perpetrator? As possible candidates, he excludes the Hittites and Babylonians, leaving open the possibility for the Egyptians, Sea Peoples, the rioting, revolting residents of Hazor themselves, and the Israelites. He argues that the Egyptians would not have been responsible for two primary reasons. First, there is not a single reference to the conquest of Hazor in the many documents from the days of Rameses II, the king of Egypt at the time. Second, as demonstrated by Kitchen, the Egyptian army did not pass near Hazor when it returned from Kadesh. The revolting Canaanite inhabitants, he argues, should also not be blamed for the destruction. One reason among several listed is the abandonment of the site following the destruction. If the city had been destroyed by its own residents, why did they leave the place after their victory? 
As for the Sea Peoples, Bentor argues that Haza lies inland, far from the coastal area in which the Sea Peoples took any interest and points out that no pottery typical of the Sea Peoples was present at the site. To him, the most reasonable conclusion is that The archaeological finds at Hazer clearly indicate that Bronze Age Hazer underwent a single destruction sometime in the course of the 13th century BCE, presumably at the hands of the tribes of Israel that had come to settle in the land. What are we to conclude then? Klein provides this helpful summary. The identification of the perpetrators is also uncertain. Ben Tor generally agrees with the previous excavator Yigael Yadin that the Israelites are the most likely and logical agents of destruction, while the other co-director, the late Sharon Zuckerman, believed that there was a period of decline immediately preceding the destruction and suggested that the devastation was perhaps caused by an internal rebellion of the city dwellers themselves, after which the city lay abandoned until sometime during the 11th century BC. There are certain things that we can determine from these data and interpretations. First, if the city was destroyed in the second half of the 13th century BCE, this is certainly problematic for the traditional date, but may work for the late date of the biblical conquest narrative, depending on when in the second half of the 13th century. However, the abandonment of the site following the last Canaanite occupation remains somewhat problematic. What can we say? The problems with the biblical conquest narrative are not trivial considering the archaeological evidence. The Hebrew Bible speaks of an invasion of Canaan following destructions in the Negev and Transjordan with the complete annihilation and burning of several important sites. As we have seen, there are two fundamental problems with many of the more significant cities that suffered such destruction. First. The archaeological record does not show destructions taking place at the time, or at the same time, in many of these cities, as those destruction layers vary from site to site, sometimes by a century or more. For example, Dessel writes, The destruction of Late Bronze Hazer was more accurately dated to the mid-13th century BCE, whereas Late Bronze Age Lachish was destroyed in the mid-12th century. So while a number of late Bronze Age city-states claim to have been destroyed by Joshua, such as Lachish, Haza, and Bethel, were indeed destroyed. They were not all destroyed at the same time. Second, several sites were not even occupied during the late Bronze Age, the period required for the Israelites to have destroyed their occupants, Dessel concludes. Many sites mentioned in conquest narratives were unoccupied in the late Bronze Age too or the Iron Age IA. This would mean that either there was no late Bronze Age city for the Israelites to destroy, or there is no evidence of a post-destruction Israelite settlement. Two particularly problematic destruction accounts that figure prominently in Joshua are I and Jericho. It is for these reasons that scholars have determined that the biblical narrative cannot be simply taken at face value. Whether there is a historical kernel in the stories is debated, but one cannot simply read the text and write an accurate account of history based upon it. William Deaver sums it up this way. The inevitable conclusion is that the book of Joshua is nearly all fictitious, of little or no value to the historian. It is largely a legend celebrating the supposed exploits of a local folk hero. What do scholars think about Israel's origins? If the consensus position among biblical scholars and archaeologists is that we cannot take the conquest story in the Hebrew Bible as historically reliable, how do scholars make sense of the origins of the ancient Israelites? To answer this question, I would like to present the positive evidence that we have concerning the emergence of Israel in the land of Canaan, followed by the particular models that scholars have historically posited to explain that data. The point of this section is not to argue for a particular explanatory model. I would rather like to equip the reader with information about the most commonly held positions among specialists in the field. What evidence do we have? In 1207 BCE, Pharaoh Merneptah listed several Canaanite groups over which he had victory in a campaign. Among them was a group known as Israel. 
This is the earliest reference that we have to the ancient Israelites, or some call proto-Israelites. Given this data point, we can say that at least by the end of the 13th century, a people group known as Israel was in the land of Canaan and had sufficient size, or sway, to draw the attention of the Pharaoh in his inscription. What other evidence do we have for these early proto-Israelites? In 2006, Abraham Faust published an important monograph entitled Israel's Ethnogenesis, Settlement, Interaction, Expansion, and Resistance, in which he laid out in some detail his views on the origins of ancient Israel. In the book, he went into painstaking detail in order to present the relevant evidence that we have that could be used to identify the ancient Israelites. While space will not allow for us to examine all or even most of the evidence, we will briefly discuss a few of the key characteristics or ethnic markers that are generally accepted as being associated with ancient Israel. Pork avoidance, circumcision, and the so-called four-room house. With these typical Israelite characteristics in mind, we will then turn to the historical models that have been used to make sense of Israel's origin in light of the data. Ethnicity before we get into the specific defining features of the ancient Israelites, a brief word on ethnicity is in order. Obviously, I have no intention of delving into the complexities of ethnicity in this section, but it is important to realize that being a part of ancient Israel or any ancient people group was not directly predicated on some type of genetic commonality. In other words, being an Israelite was more about doing what Israelites did than being biologically connected to a particular group of people. Faust explains, it is accepted today that groups define themselves in relation to, and in contrast with, other groups. The ethnic boundaries of a group are not defined by the sum of cultural traits, but by the idiosyncratic use of specific material and behavioral symbols as compared with other groups. Members of a particular ethnic group set themselves apart from other groups by the things they say, do, wear, eat, etc. Let me try to give an analogy. If your high school was anything like mine, there were different groups that distinguished themselves from one another, like the nerds, jocks, etc. What made each group distinct was often what they did differently from the other groups. And one could place a person into one of the groups based on what they wore, how they acted, etc. The same is true for ancient ethnic groups. If we can identify a shared constellation of characteristics that are shared among a certain group that distinguish that group from the other groups, these can be called that particular group's ethnic markers. While Faust argues that we can't simply identify someone as part of an ethnic group because of one of these characteristics. He concludes that there is enough of a correlation between various aspects of the material culture and the people living in the hill country of Canaan to determine that these were ancient Israelites. He writes, What we are searching for is therefore the historical context in which the different traits could have become meaningful and from which they were bestowed with additional and new meaning. In other words, the goal is to identify several characteristics or customs that were known to be common to ancient Israelites. This will aid in identifying groups that appear to have adhered to a set of shared customs in the early Iron Age in Canaan, allowing us to reasonably determine when and how ancient Israel formed. One of the difficulties is determining not only what the ethnic markers are, but also when they were considered ethnic markers. Returning to our high school analogy, certain clothing only takes on a specific meaning at a particular point in time. For example, if you saw a picture of someone wearing Dr. Martin's boots, unless you saw the rest of their outfit or knew when the picture was taken, it would be difficult to determine if they were more into heavy metal during the 1990s when I was in high school, or if they were part of the hipster crowd today. Thus, it is not enough to know what the ethnic marker is. We also need to consider when it is being used. When it comes to ethnic markers that are used to identify ancient Israelite culture, there's a great deal of textual and archaeological evidence that many of these characteristics carried specific meaning later in the first millennium BCE. The question is whether these characteristics appear in the earlier Iron Age 1, when we think Israel was forming, and if so, whether they also carried the same meaning for the Israelites at that time. Taboo on pork consumption. 
There's a scene from Seinfeld that has been indelibly impressed upon my brain. Elaine, stuck in coach on a flight back to New York, is shorted her in-flight meal. The flight attendant offers her the only meal he has left, a kosher meal. Kosher meal? I don't want a kosher meal. I don't even know what a kosher meal is, she laments. A nearby passenger pipes up, I think it means when a rabbi has inspected it or something. No, no, says a woman in the next seat. It all has to do with the way they kill the pig. No, come on. They don't eat pigs, the man responds. Yet she insists, they do if it's killed right under a rabbi's supervision. If there's one thing that stands out as taboo to Jewish communities, it is eating pork products. And it was no different in ancient Israel. Altman explains. The evidence points to a general lack of pig consumption in areas associated with the Israelite settlements in the highlands of Judah and Ephraim during the early Iron Age. In contrast, pig bones are more prevalent in the areas associated with Philistine settlement in the lowlands, Shepala, and on the coast. While we should be careful not to equate pots with people, directly and necessarily leaking material culture remains with ethnicity. The presence or absence of pig remains in early settlements is commonly used to identify an early Israelite site. Dever writes, a number of scholars who are otherwise skeptical about determining ethnic identity from material culture remains in this case acknowledge the obvious, that here we seem to have at least one ethnic trait of later biblical Israel that can safely be projected back to its earliest days. Faust pointed out that in Iron Age 1, the analysis clearly shows that sites that can be regarded as Israelite did not yield pig bones while Philistine sites had them in abundance. He lists several sites, both Philistine and Israelite, that show the percentage of pig bones found during their excavations. A few of these are listed below for comparison. As you can clearly see from just these few examples, the sites associated with early Israelites contain little to no pig bones, while far more substantial amounts are found at Philistine sites. What would account for the avoidance of pork products at the Israelite sites? Finkelstein and Silberman write, A ban on pork can not be explained by environmental or economic reasons alone. Fast agrees. Evidence that the absence of pig meat in the Iron Mai Highland sites is not a result of ecological conditions can be seen by their discovery, sometimes in large quantities, in Bronze Age sites in the highlands and lowlands. It would appear that lack of pig consumption became an important ethnic marker for the Israelites, particularly as it caused them to be quite distinct from the nearby Philistines as well as other surrounding people groups. Finkelstein and Silberman write, Perhaps the proto-Israelites stopped eating pork merely because the surrounding peoples, their adversaries, did eat it, and they had begun to see themselves as different. Just as interesting is the fact that the Philistines apparently did not maintain this practice of consuming pork as a significant part of their diet later in Iron Age 2, yet the Israelites did maintain their ban on pork during the later periods. Faust concludes from this. It is reasonable to assume that pig avoidance was chosen in contrast to the Philistine custom of consuming large amounts of pork. And since this is relevant only to the Iron Age, why? then behavior that contrasts this custom could have only been formed then. In other words, if the Israelites were known in the later periods for not eating pork, and the Philistines were only known for eating large quantities of pork during the earlier Iron Age 1 period, then the custom of the Israelites not eating pork most likely developed in the earlier period, when it would have set them apart from those that did eat pork. Thus, if we see little to no pork consumption in Iron Age 1 settlement, that is substantial evidence for it being an Israelite settlement. I brought up the pig bones with archaeologist Jonathan Adler in an email, and he updated me that in 2013, an article called Pig Husbandry in Iron Age Israel and Judah, new insights regarding the origin of the taboo, a different perspective, gets mentioned. These data show that Philistines in cities raised pigs and consumed pork. Philistines at rural sites didn't raise and eat pigs. Judeans in Iron II didn't raise pigs. Israelites at the same time did raise and eat pigs. Bottom line, there are many reasons to raise or not raise pigs. One could say that pork did not characterize Judean cuisine. This would be fair, but no reason to think it was a taboo, that it was related to anything religious or had anything to do with any putative Torah. Circumcision.
Although circumcision is known from the Hebrew Bible as a distinct characteristic of Israelite culture, see Genesis 17 and Joshua 5, for example, the custom did not originate with the Israelites. The practice can be traced at least as far back as the 3rd millennium BCE, both in Syria and Egypt. In spite of the early history of the ritual practice, it seems clear that the Israelites adopted circumcision in such a way that it set them apart from the nations around them. In the Hebrew Bible, we see that the term uncircumcised is used as a pejorative when referring to groups like the Philistines. However, the context in which the term is used this way appeared to refer to the time of Israel's formative years in Iron Age 1. In other words, when we see a Philistine being called uncircumcised in a derogatory sense, like in the books of Samuel, it is supposed to be describing a time early in Israel's history. Faust writes, The striking element is that they refer to the Philistines in such a negative manner, only in texts that are meant to describe the reality during the late Iron Wives. Other biblical texts suggest that the Philistines began practicing circumcision by the later Iron Age II. For example, Foss cites Ezekiel 32 where The prophet's list of uncircumcised peoples includes Assyria, Elam, and some others among the latter, but no mention is made of the Philistines. If, in fact, the Philistines were practicing circumcision after the Iron Age I, then, as Faust argued concerning pork consumption, the time that the Israelites would have distinguished themselves by practicing circumcision would more likely have been the earlier period. He concludes, This explanation goes well with the biblical view, which uses circumcision in certain earlier contexts as an ethnic marker. The four-room or pillared house. The typical pillar courtyard house is best seen as a farmhouse, providing a large nuclear or extended family with all its needs. These houses are often referred to in the literature as four-room or three-room houses, because the plan is that of a U-shaped structure with two or three rooms or banks of rooms surrounding a central courtyard. While this type of residential architecture was not restricted to Iron Age I highlands, it is part of the constellation of characteristics that can help us identify early Israelite ethnicity. The four-room house is theorized to have been used because it was well suited for the environment. Stagger writes, The pillared house takes its form not from some desert nostalgia monumentalized in stone and mud brick, but from a living tradition. It was first and foremost a successful adaptation to farm life. The ground floor had space allocated for food processing, small craft production, stabling, and storage. The second floor was suitable for dining, sleeping, and other activities. He concludes, Its longevity attests to its continuing suitability not only to the environment, but also for the socio-economic unit housed in it. For the most part, rural families who farmed and raised livestock. Scholars have rightfully called into question the practice of identifying a house or site as Israelite simply because it is or contains a four-room house. As mentioned above, the early Israelites were not the only ones who used this type of construction. Dessel notes, It is quite clear that this architectural type was used over a long time and a wide geographical distribution which calls into question how well the four-room house constitutes a reliable indicator of Israelite culture. Fost's argument is not that the four-room house was exclusively Israelite. Instead, he argues that it became the standard form of residential construction for the Israelites, being used far more consistently than the groups around them. In this way, when combined with the other ethnic markers, it provides more weight to identifying a household as Israelite. There are obviously many other ethnic markers that have been identified as customarily early Israelite, including pottery types, egalitarian social structures, and settlement patterns. However, this section was designed to give the viewer an introduction to how archaeologists utilize the material culture to attempt to identify a household or city as Israelite during the early stages of their formation, the Iron Age I, and what that data can tell us about their origins and the process of their formation. Models of Israelite Formation What do we know about the early Israelites 
specifically during the last 200 years or so of the second millennium BCE. We know that Pharaoh Manetha mentioned a group of people in Canaan that he referred to as Israel in 1207 BCE. This strongly suggests that by this time, the Israelites had become ethnically distinct to some degree and were enough of a force to be mentioned in the Pharaoh's inscription. We know that there were certain features that seemed to appear together at sites in the highlands of Canaan during this period, including things like ban on pork, possibly, the practice of circumcision, and the use of the four-room house. It would appear, therefore, that by the early Iron Age, the Israelites were settled, or were in the process of settling, in the land of Canaan. But how did they get there? What was the process that gave rise to a group of people identifying themselves as Israelites? Over the years, there have been several models that scholars have put forward to explain the various data points, like the ones we just discussed. These models can be divided into two categories outsider and insider models. Outsider models postulate that the Israelites were a group of people that were originally outside the land of Canaan and entered in to form Israel. These can be subdivided into two individual models, conquest and peaceful infiltration. We have seen the conquest model throughout this chapter. It is the type that is described by the biblical narrative, although it allows for some variation. The insider models can be similarly subdivided, internal or peasants, revolt, and pastoral Canaanite or agrarian reform. Outsider model number one, conquest. We have examined throughout this documentary the idea of an outside group entering the land of Canaan and taking it by force. This traditional view was supported by such influential scholars as William Foxwell Albright. Dessel explains Albright's position. For Albright, the discovery of destruction layers at sites with impressive biblical pedigrees, such as Megiddo, Lachish, and Bethel, as well as the discovery of a late Bronze Age destruction in his own excavations at Tel Beit Mirsim, which he identified as Biblical Debir, supported the biblical narratives found in Joshua 6, 12. As we have seen, there are serious problems with the conquest model. With only a few possible exceptions, every site that has been excavated presents archaeological data that conflict with the biblical conquest account. Deaver sums it up in this way. We must confront the fact that the external material evidence supports almost nothing of the biblical account of a large-scale concerted Israelite military invasion of Canaan, either that of numbers east of the Jordan or of Joshua west of the Jordan. Of the more than 40 sites that the biblical texts claim were conquered, no more than two or three of those have been archaeologically investigated and are even potential candidates for such an Israelite destruction in the entire period from CA 1250-1150 BC. Outsider model number two, peaceful infiltration. If the Israelites did not enter the land guns blazing, is there a way to posit that they still came into Canaan from the outside? Albrecht Alt and Martin Noth, scholars from the early 20th century, thought so. Rather than one massive horde exiting Egypt and entering Canaan, Alt and Noth essentially argued that smaller, more mobile groups had entered Canaan over an extended period of time, slowly settling in the highlands. Dessel explains, Alt argued that the earliest penetration of the Israelites into Canaan came in the late 13th and early 12th centuries BCE and formed a long, gradual process in which desert pastoralists moved peacefully from the steppe region to the east, the Transjordanian Plateau and Highlands, and settled even closer to establish it, Canaanite city-states. There are several issues with the peaceful infiltration model. Much of it is predicated on the idea that pastoral nomads who brought their flocks into Canaan from the outside slowly began to voluntarily settle down and gave up their transitory lifestyle for a sedentary one. However, Deaver argues, Numerous ethnographic studies have shown that pastoral nomads tend to settle only when forced by central authorities to do so, as has happened in much of the Middle East in recent years. But in this instance, there was no central authority to enforce anything. The Egyptian authorities had decamped, leaving Canaan unpoliced. Klein also doubts this hypothesis. I also do not embrace the peaceful infiltration model that suggests the Israelites simply wandered in over time and eventually took over. Again, 
because there is no mention of them in the texts, unless the Israelites are the Habiru, an idea that scholars have slowly discounted over the past several decades. Insider model number one, internal or peasants revolt. If they didn't come in from the outside, then that must mean that they were already in the land of Canaan. One way to explain the data using an insider model is to suggest that the Israelites were originally a group of peasants who rebelled against their oppressive Canaanite overlords. This theory was put forward first by George Mendenhall and later by Norman Gottwald in the middle of the 20th century. Gottwald's argument are summarized by Deaver. First, Early Israel was the result not of an overnight military conquest of foreigners, but rather of long, drawn-out socio-cultural and religious revolution. It was mounted by local Canaanite peasants of the late Bronze, early Iron Eye horizon, who revolted against their corrupt overlords and gradually formed a new ethnic entity and society. Second, the driving force behind this revolution was largely religious, the liberating power of faith in Israel's unique national deity, Yahweh. As you might expect, this theory is not without its problems. Neither Mendenhall nor Gottwald had archaeological experience, so unsurprisingly, there was little evidence from the material culture to support their ideas. However, this theory did provide one important idea to the discussion, that the Israelites were not outside invaders, but rather were indigenous to the land. Insider model number two, pastoral Canaanites or agrarian reform. In 1988, Israel Finkelstein developed a new internal model of Israelite formation. Essentially, he argued that the Israelites were indeed indigenous people. Specifically, they were made up of Canaanite pastoralists who, over the course of the late Bronze Age, left their transhuman life, moving their flocks from place to place seasonally, and settled down in the highlands of Canaan, he writes, Groups of pastoralists who had been active in a transhuman routine in the frontier zones of the country during the late Bronze period began to settle down at the end of the 13th century or beginning of the 12th. The best areas open to settlement were in the hill country because they met two basic requirements. They were essentially devoid of Canaanites, and they were conducive to a combination of cereal crops and pasturage, the preferred economic structure during the initial stages of sedentarization. In other words, according to Finkelstein, the early Israelites were Canaanite pastoralists who settled in the highlands. William Deaver has strongly criticized Finkelstein's conclusions. One of the key criticisms is the number of available pastoralists that could occupy the highlands so significantly during the Iron Age I. There would have been only about 12,000 people in the highlands of Canaan in the 13th century BCE. It is usually estimated that about 10% of the population, that is approximately 1,200, would have been pastoralists. Yet a century later, the population of the highland villages had grown to about 40 to 50,000. There must have been a large influx of people from outside the local pastoral nomadic groups. Deaver argues that this large influx of Canaanites into the highlands did not simply come from pastoralists, but instead must have also included a mixed multitude of people from the Canaanite cities that were falling apart at the end of the Late Bronze Age. Following the attacks of the Sea Peoples, and in conjunction with the climate change in the region, the urban areas were losing their occupants. He writes, It is these local land-hungry peasants and outcasts not imaginary pastoralists, that formed the reservoir from which the hill country colonists were derived. He refers to his model as agrarian, because it posits that the motivation behind these displaced Canaanites forming Israel as they did was the dream of greater equality of distribution of their new homeland. He concludes, That focus on possession of land, on the rural life as the good life, runs throughout the Pentateuch, the Deuteronomistic history, and the prophets. Here the biblical memory is genuine. It goes back to earliest Israel's experience as a people without a land. Similarly, David Elan has recently argued that Egyptian administrative practices in Canaan likely played a significant role in the formation of early Israel. There is no doubt that the first settlements were established in the 13th or early 12th century BCE, when Egypt still maintained a network of garrisons and administrative centers in the lowlands.
Egyptians. During the Late Bronze Age, when Egypt was in control of the region, the Egyptians stationed officials in these settlements in Canaan. Elon argues, It is likely that Egypt practiced a policy similar to that of Rome 1,000 years later. Foreign soldiers and functionaries, by now married to local women with families, were encouraged at the end of their service to establish farmsteads in the problematic frontier zone. This connection with the Egyptian crown would explain, he argues, some connections between the material culture and Egypt. As Egypt's control over the region waned, the inhabitants of the region scrambled and competed for resources, ultimately leading to the differentiated ethnic groups, including Israel. What's the key takeaway? We've looked at the four primary models that have been proposed to explain the origins of ancient Israel. Two assumed that the Israelites entered the land of Canaan from the outside, one through conquest, the other other by the way of peaceful infiltration over time. The two insider models posit that the Israelites were actually Canaanites who settled in the highlands for different reasons depending on the model. In the end, however, what is the most important thing to conclude from this section? The question that I always want to ask in these situations is, is there a consensus position among the experts in the field? Deaver answers that question for us in this way. There is now overwhelming support in favor of a new model for early Israel. The traditional conquest, peaceful infiltration, and peasant revolt models have all been overturned in the light of the archaeological data presented here. There is now a universal consensus among not only archaeologists but also biblical scholars that a new ethnic group called Israelites came from among the indigenous peoples of the region. The only question is, where within Canaan? Deaver is arguing that the consensus among experts in the relevant fields is that the Israelites were in fact Canaanites. The only point of contention is which Canaanites? Pastoralists, city dwellers, other outcasts? In other words, while there is debate about which Canaanites ended up becoming Israelites, scholars agree that they were always Canaanites from the start. Conclusion from Archaeology Today, almost every scholar accepts that the book of Joshua does not reflect the actual historical process that led to the existence of Israel in their land. Traditionally, people have relied on the text of the Old Testament to inform them about the history of the nation of Israel, while some of the particularly later accounts in the narratives contain far more precise historical information. The same cannot be said for stories about the nation's formative period. Where did the Israelites come from? If we were to simply rely on the Hebrew Bible, in books like Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua, we would conclude that Moses led the people out of Egypt through the region of Transjordan, and Joshua brought them into the land of Canaan to conquer and settle. But is this story reliable? We have spent a great deal of time in this chapter examining the claims of the Old Testament with respect to the Israelite conquest of Canaan. We began where any good investigation into this topic should. What does the Hebrew Bible actually report? We saw in the narrative that several cities were conquered before the Israelites crossed over Jordan, including Arad, Heshbon, and Dibon. After they entered the land, Joshua led the people in a conquest of cities throughout Canaan, including famous cities like Jericho, Ai, Lachish, and Hazor. According to the biblical text, this conquest would have taken place during the Late Bronze Age, either around 1407, the traditional view, or sometime in the mid to late 13th century, the mainstream view. In order to determine the historical validity of these accounts from an archaeological perspective, we tackled the issue with two questions. First, do we see occupation of the cities said to have been destroyed in the narrative during the Late Bronze Age? If there was occupation during this period, we asked, was that occupation destroyed at the requisite time? Put more simply, if the Bible says that the Israelites destroyed these cities, were there people in them? And does the archaeology show that these cities were destroyed? We began with three cities that are purported to have been destroyed before the Israelites crossed the Jordan. Arad in the Negev and Heshbon and Dibon in the Transjordan. We discovered at Arad that following occupation in the 3rd millennium BCE, the site was abandoned until after the Late Bronze Age, leaving behind no city in existence for the Israelites to destroy. A similar picture was painted by the archaeology of Heshbon, which shows no occupation earlier than 1200 BCE. Finally, at Dibon, 
we see early Bronze Age levels followed by a break in occupation, which is the only re-established in the Iron Age. In all three sites, there appear to be no late Bronze Age remains of cities that the Israelites could have destroyed. The situation does not improve much as we cross over into Canaan, beginning with Jericho. Despite some debate over the dating of some of the features, especially a wall from the early Bronze Age, we saw that at most there was a small unwalled village at Jericho at the time when the Israelites are said to have destroyed it. This, of course, is completely, completely at odds with the biblical account. From there, we move to the city of Ai, which appears much like Ered and Dibon. There was occupation at the site in the 3rd millennium BCE, but the city was abandoned during the Late Bronze Age. When the site was reoccupied around 1200 BCE, it showed no fortifications. With Jericho and Ai standing firmly at odds with the stories in the book of Joshua, we turn to Lachish. There was occupation at the site during the Late Bronze Age and a destruction occurring around 1200 BCE. However, we saw that the city immediately rebuilt as a Canaanite city, which poses problems for the biblical story. Finally, we investigated the archaeology of Hazor, which is the one city that we examined that may fit at least in part, with the Old Testament narrative. The city was destroyed in the mid to late 13th century, which is problematic for the traditional date and could still be problematic depending on when in the 13th century it was destroyed. Nevertheless, it may fit well with the biblical narrative. And although the site was abandoned for approximately two centuries after its destruction, it does appear to have been ultimately occupied by the Israelites. In the end, there is little direct historical or archaeological evidence that would support the biblical account of the conquest. Most of the cities were either unoccupied during the Late Bronze Age or show destructions at the wrong time to support the Old Testament story. Aside from few Christian conservative, often fundamentalist, scholars, the consensus among experts in the relevant fields is that we must seek another explanation for Israel's early formation. Given the data that we have from ethnic and chronological markets, Markers. Several different models have been advanced over the last century, including both outsider, Israelites coming from outside Canaan, and insider, Israelites being indigenous to Canaan, models. It appears that scholars have concluded that both outsider models, conquest and peaceful infiltration, as well as the insider model known as peasants revolt are no longer tenable based on the archaeological data now known. Instead, nearly everyone appears to agree that the Israelites were in fact Canaanites who settled down in the hill country. The debated issue is who these Canaanites were. For example, pastoralist or disenfranchised city dwellers. The bottom line is this. The story of the Israelite conquest as told in the Old Testament appears untenable in light of the archaeological evidence. No single mass of outside conquerors entered Canaan and destroyed multiple Canaanite strongholds. This picture simply does not match the archaeological record. This does not mean that there was no Iron Age I Israel, or that all the information in the Hebrew Bible, perhaps representing historical kernels or memories, is necessarily false. We need to move away from the idea that the books of Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua generally represent accurate historical events, and instead seek to explain the data collected by archaeological investigation by a different model. Just saying, the Bible says will no longer suffice. Joshua's Greek Myth and Legend Deuteronomy wraps up what's traditionally known as the Pentateuch. But I'm here to suggest that this neat division might not be what the original author had in mind. Scholars like Spinoza and more recently Vasilius and Wajenbaum argue that this author didn't just stop at Deuteronomy, but continued pinning the narrative straight through to Kings. This makes Joshua not so much a new book, but the next chapter of Deuteronomy with a seamless transition in style language, and content. With Moses having exited stage left, Joshua steps into the spotlight, ready to lead the charge into the promised land. The conquest of Canaan has all the drama of the Trojan War, hinting that the epic siege of Jericho might have been more than just a bit inspired by a similar showdown in Troy. The plot thickens in the second act, where lands are divvied up like a heavenly lottery, echoing Plato's musings on an ideal society. 
The narrative is grounded with mentions of real cities, but let's not be fooled. It seems our author was channeling Plato more than any cartographer. Rahab Thino Joshua masterminds a covert op, sending a pair of spies to the fortified city of Jericho. They find an unlikely hideout in Rahab's place. A local lady known for her, let's just say, nighttime hospitality, Joshua 2, 1 through 24. These gents make their grand exit via a makeshift rope ladder right out of Rahab's window, which conveniently overlooks the city walls. In a promise that could rival any spy thriller, they vow to protect her abode when the siege kicks off. Rahab's task? Hang a scarlet rope out her window. Jericho's own version of a do not disturb sign for the invading troops. As Joshua's forces circle the city like a biblical SWAT team, they bring the house down, quite literally, with a trumpet fanfare that makes Jericho's walls crumble. Joshua 6, 22-23 Rahab and her family get out in one piece, while the rest of the city isn't so lucky. But the plot thickens post-victory. A chap from Judah, Achan, decides a bit of looting is in order and gets caught red-handed. The penalty? Let's just say it's severe. Joshua 7. Now here's where it gets interesting. Some eagle-eyed rabbis have poured over this tale and suggest those incognito spies were none other than Perez and Zera, ancient twins from the Judah family line, supposedly long gone. The connection? Both stories feature our leading ladies, Tamar and Rahab, in less than glamorous roles, Hebrew Zona, Genesis 38, 15, and Joshua 2, 1. But with a knack for survival and a penchant for crimson accessories that seem to change the course of history, whether it's a thread on a newborn's wrist or a rope from a window, these red lines tied together tales of deception, deliverance, and destiny in a narrative knot that's as colorful as it is complex. When the time of her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. While she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and bound on his hand a crimson thread, saying, this one came out first. But just then he drew back his hand, and out came his brother. And she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore he was named Perez. Afterwards his brother came out with the crimson thread on his hand. And he was named Zerah, Gen 38, 27, 30. The motif of the crimson thread weaves a fascinating connection between the stories of Tamar and Rahab. In the Genesis account, a dramatic scene unfolds as Zerah's arm emerges first from the womb, marked by a crimson thread only to be retracted as his brother Perez precedes him in birth. This tumultuous event not only signifies the struggle for primacy between the twins, but also metaphorically rends their mother's body, a visceral emblem of their contested emergence into the world. Fast forward to the book of Joshua, where the crimson thread reappears, this time as a rope dangling from the walls of Jericho. Here, it serves as a signal for the Israelite soldiers to spare the house it marks in a twist of fate. A descendant of Zerah meets his end just after the city's fall. Intriguingly, Jericho is occasionally referred to as the City of Tamar, named after the biblical figure associated with palm trees, a symbol of triumph and victory, Deuteronomy 34.3 and Judges 3.13. This designation intertwines the stories of Tamar and Rahab, creating a symbolic parallel between the birthing of twins from a woman and the emergence of spies from a city, as if Jericho itself experiences the throes of labor. In Genesis, Tamar endures the physical ordeal of childbirth, while in Joshua, the city of Tamar becomes a metaphorical pregnant entity, its walls breached by two men escaping via a crimson lifeline. Kinda similar. This scarlet thread first adorning Zara's arm and later the city's defenses suggests a deeper link between the personal and the communal, the individual birth and the collective destiny. Rahab the prostitute who aids the spies might initially seem a far cry from the matriarchal figure of Tamar. However, 
Her role as a facilitator of escape casts her in the light of a midwife, a pivotal agent in the drama of birth and survival. Thus, Rahab and the city of Jericho together assume the role of the pregnant Tamar, with the city's fall mirroring the pain and turmoil of childbirth. Rabbis have further layered this narrative by identifying the two spies with Perez and Zera, reinforcing the cyclical nature of these stories where the past continually echoes in the present. This literary device not only bridges generations, but also encapsulates the enduring struggle and redemption woven into the fabric of human and divine history. Through the crimson thread, the biblical narrative stitches together stories of birth, struggle, and survival, inviting readers to ponder the intricate patterns of fate and providence in the tapestry of life. The two of them, Perez and Zerah, were sent by Joshua as spies. The thread that Rahab tied to her window as a sign for Israel's army, she received it from Zerah. It was the crimson thread that the midwife had tied on his wrist to point him as the firstborn before he was pulled back. In the narrative design of the Bible, the writer constructs a canvas, setting side by side two distinct yet thematically intertwined stories, one from Genesis and its counterpart from Joshua. This storytelling approach beckons the reader into an intellectual pursuit, a quest to unravel the enigmatic connections between the two stories. This method resonates with Claude Levi Strauss's concept of a synchronic reading of myths, where the temporal sequence is less important than the overarching patterns and themes. The deliberate identification of the spies as Perez and Zera, despite chronological inconsistencies, serves as a literary bridge linking the two stories and inviting deeper contemplation. The presence of a descendant of Zera in Joshua 7 is a subtle yet potent clue, hinting at a narrative continuity and purposeful design by the author. This technique of transmuting a pregnant woman into a city finds a parallel in the transformation of Jacob, initially depicted as a patriarch with 12 sons, who later symbolizes a nation comprised of 12 tribes in the book of Joshua. This metamorphosis reflects the platonic notion of the ideal state, where the individual soul mirrors a larger societal entity, the fall of Jericho, the quintessential Canaanite city, symbolizes the emergence of Israel, much like Tamar's painful childbirth heralds the future lineage of kings through Judah. The Gospel of Matthew weaves this theme further by tracing Jesus' lineage back to Rahab, linking her to David through Boaz, Matthew 1, verse 5. This genealogical line not only grounds the narrative in history, but also imbues it with a sense of destiny and divine providence. The biblical narrative echoes and adapts a story from Greek mythology, where Athena and Theno protect Menelaus and Odysseus in Troy, marking their house with a leopard skin for identification. See Pausanias's Description of Greece 10, 27, 2. The biblical writer, aware of this story, perhaps from Sophocles' lost play Etenorides, substitutes the leopard skin with the crimson rope. This alteration is not merely cosmetic. It deepens the metaphorical resonance of the story. Aligning the crimson rope with the concept of an umbilical cord, this rope then becomes more than a mere sign. It is a lifeline, a symbol of birth and connection, tying the emerging nation to its historical and spiritual roots. In this way, the biblical narrative employs and transforms existing stories, weaving them into a complex tapestry of meaning that speaks of birth, identity, and enduring bonds that connect the past with the present and future. Through these layers of storytelling, the reader is invited to explore the profound connections between individual narratives and the collective experience between the human and the divine. This is going to be a continuation of the work of Philip Wagenbaum's work, Argonauts of the Desert, comparing biblical narratives to the Greek myths and histories. The Stopping of the Sun In the grand tapestry of ancient narratives, two monumental requests to the heavens stand out, intertwining fate with the celestial dance of the sun and moon. In the biblical epic, as chronicled in the book of Joshua, we encounter a moment of divine intervention unparalleled in history. 
Joshua, leading the Israelites in a fierce battle against the Amorites, beseeches the Lord in a dramatic entreaty. Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. The cosmos obeys, halting in its tracks, granting daylight until victory is secured. This astonishing event is meticulously recorded in the book of Jasher, though its authenticity remains shrouded in mystery. On the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in mid-heaven, and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since, when the Lord heeded a human voice, for the Lord fought for Israel. Contrast this with the Homeric saga of Agamemnon in the Iliad, where the Greek king implores Zeus, the sovereign of the skies, to delay nightfall until Troy falls and Hector's heart is pierced by his sword. Unlike the biblical account, Zeus denies this plea, underscoring the capricious nature of the gods. Homer's narrative further complicates the celestial dynamics as Athena, in a subsequent act, accelerates the sunset to save the beleaguered Greeks. Agamemnon prayed, saying, Zeus, most glorious supreme that dwellest in heaven, and ridest upon the storm cloud, grant that the sun may not go down, nor the night fall, till the palace of Priam is laid low, and its gates are consumed with fire. Grant that my sword may pierce the shirt of Hector about his heart, and that full many of his comrades may bite the dust as they fall dying round him. These two narratives, one from the Hebrew scriptures, and the other from Greek epic poetry, offer a fascinating study in divine responsiveness. While the God of Israel actively participates in the battlefield fate, the Olympian deities display a more detached demeanor. Intriguingly, the Iliad might not just be a parallel narrative, but a potential source for the biblical story. The name of one of the Amorite kings, Piram, intriguingly mirrors that of the king Priam of Troy, hinting at a textual interplay between these ancient cultures. Thus, we are left to ponder the nature of divine intervention and the intertextual echoes between these epic traditions. Whether seen as literal events or metaphorical tales, they continue to inspire and provoke bridging millennia through the power of storytelling and the enduring human quest to understand the divine. Joshua Odysseus In my Origins of Joseph documentary, we have seen that Joseph's narrative in the Hebrew Bible intriguingly mirrors that of Odysseus, the wily Greek hero from Homer's Odyssey. This comparative analysis reveals more than mere coincidence. It uncovers a shared motif of return and recognition that transcends cultural boundaries. Odysseus's long-awaited return to Ithaca, as recounted in Odyssey 14, is marked by his disguise and a series of tests to ascertain the loyalty of his servants and family. Similarly, the story of Joseph unfolds with a dramatic journey from favored son to slave, then to a powerful Egyptian official. His eventual revelation to his brothers, who do not recognize him at first, mirrors the theme of disguised return in Odysseus' story. Odyssey 13 provides further parallels, detailing Odysseus' return to Ithaca with treasures from the Phaeacians and his initial incognito encounter with Athena. These elements resonate with the book of Joshua, where the Israelites, bearing the covenant and the blessings of their journey, return to reclaim the promised land after generations of exile in Egypt. The themes of divine guidance, the journey home, and the reclamation of one's birthright are central to both narratives. The concept of nostos, or homecoming, is pivotal in these stories. For Joshua and the Israelites, the conquest of Canaan is not just a military campaign, but a divinely orchestrated return to a land promised to their forefathers. This echoes the emotional and spiritual journey of Odysseus back to his homeland. Both are stories of long-awaited returns filled with challenges and transformations that test the protagonist's wisdom 
resilience, and identity. In comparing these narratives, one might speculate about the cultural exchanges in the ancient world. The stories of the Hebrew Bible and the Odyssey may have evolved independently, but they share universal themes that likely resonated across the Mediterranean. These stories reflect a collective human experience, capturing the deep-seated desire to return home and the complex interactions with the divine that guide these epic journeys. Thus, the parallel between Joseph's story and Odysseus's adventures is more than a literary curiosity. It's a testament to the shared human condition. Take it back to where I end um, that guide these epic journeys. Now let us compare the sources from the Bible to the Odyssey. Once when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you one of us or one of our adversaries? He replied, Neither, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And he said to him, What do you command your servant, my Lord? The commander of the army of the Lord said to Joshua, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua 5, 13, 15. Then Athena came up to him disguised as a young shepherd of delicate and princely dress, with a good cloak folded double about her shoulders. She had sandals on her comely feet and held a javelin in her hand. Odysseus was glad when he saw her and went straight up to her. My friend, said he, you are the first person whom I have met with in this country. I salute you, therefore, and beg you to be well disposed towards me. Protect these my goods, and myself too, for I. Embrace your knees and pray to you as though you were a god. Odyssey the Athene, 220, 30. Joshua said, Ah, Lord God, why have you brought this people across the Jordan at all, to hand us over to the Amorites so as to destroy us? Would that we had been content to settle beyond the Jordan. Joshua 7, 7. Alas! he exclaimed. Among what manner of people am I fallen? Are they savage and uncivilized or hospitable and humane? Where shall I put all this treasure and which way shall I go? I wish I had stayed over there with the Phaeacian. Or I could have gone to some other great chief who would have been good to me and given me an escort. As it is, I do not know where to put my treasure and I cannot leave it here for fear somebody else should get hold of it. Odyssey, the theme, 200, 205. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning. They went and prepared provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins worn out and torn and mended with worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes and all their provisions were dry and moldy. Joshua 9, 3, 5. As she spoke, Athena touched him with her wand and covered him with wrinkles, took away all his yellow hair and withered the flesh over his whole body. She bleared his eyes, which were naturally very fine ones. She changed his clothes and threw an old rag of a wrap about him and a tunic, tattered, filthy, and begrimed with smoke. She also gave him an undressed deer skin as an outer garment and furnished him with a staff and a wallet, all in holes, with a twisted thong for him to sling it over his shoulder. Odyssey the Thene, 430, 40. Meanwhile, these five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave at Makedar. And it was told Joshua, the five kings have been found hidden in the cave at Makedar. Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. Joshua 10, 16 to 18. Take heart and do not trouble yourself about that, rejoined Athena. Let us rather set about stowing your things at once in the cave, where they will be quite safe. Let us see how we can best manage it all. Therewith, she went down into the cave to look for the safest hiding places, while Ulysses brought up all the treasure of gold, bronze, and good clothing which the Phaeacians had given him. They stowed everything carefully away, and Athena set a stone against the door of the cave. Odyssey the Fiend, 360-70. And Akan answered Joshua, It is true, I am the one who sinned against the Lord God of Israel. This is what I did when I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I coveted them and took them. They now lie hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Joshua 7, 20, 21. 
All these parallels are clustered in Odyssey 13. When compared to several similar chapters of Joshua, there is little room left for coincidence. The Division of the Land Chapters 14 through 19 of the book of Joshua provide a meticulous account of the division of Canaan among the Israelite tribes, a narrative rich in detail and symbolism that reflects the culmination of a divine promise and the intricate planning of an emerging nation. This section is not merely a dry administrative record. It's a literary unfolding of order, promise, and identity. The narrative begins with the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, who had already settled east of the Jordan, as detailed in Numbers 30. Their participation in the conquest despite their prior settlement underscores a collective commitment to the divine plan. The allocation begins with Judah, followed by Joseph and Benjamin, each with its challenges and nuances. Notably, the text mentions Jerusalem, a city that remains unconquered, hinting at future struggles and the complex reality of nation building. As the land is divided, the author doesn't shy away from the imperfections and complexities of this process. The men of Joseph express dissatisfaction, reflective of the human element in even divinely guided endeavors. The narrative also acknowledges the continued presence of Canaanite populations, a reminder of the layered and contentious history of the land. Chapters 20 and 21 transition to the establishment of cities of refuge and allocations for the Levites, respectively. These chapters highlight the legal and religious dimensions of Israelite society, emphasizing the importance of sanctuary and service in their communal life. The Levites, without land of their own, are dispersed among the tribes, serving as a spiritual and moral anchor for the nation. The recurrence of the Transjordanian tribes story in chapter 22 underscores the unity and shared fate of all 12 tribes, despite their diverse inheritances. This repetition serves as a literary and thematic bridge connecting the past, present, and future of Israel. From a broader literary perspective, the detailed catalogs of territories and cities reflect a mimetic technique where the physical realization of land division mirrors the divine model, much like a craftsman creating a sanctuary. This approach resonates with Platonic thought, particularly the ideal state described in Plato's Laws, where the division of land and roles aims for a harmonious society. The division into 12, despite the Levites' lack of a territorial share, ensures the symbolic completeness of Israel, with Joseph's double portion maintaining the balance. This structure reflects not just a physical reality, but a deep-seated belief in divine order and covenant. The seamless literary flow from Genesis to kings, contrary to traditions that separate the Pentateuch from subsequent books, suggests a profound unity in these texts, according to Dr. Vajenbaum. This unity hints at underlying sources and influences, possibly including Greek thought, that inform the biblical narrative. The continuity and coherence of these books testify to a sophisticated literary and theological vision, weaving together law, history, and divine promises into a single compelling narrative, Joseph's Burial. As Joshua's life draws to a close, he convenes an assembly at Shechem, place of deep historical and spiritual significance for Israel. This gathering is not just a farewell, but a poignant reiteration of the nation's covenant with God. The narrative becomes a reflective mirror, capturing the collective memory and ongoing commitment of the Israelites to their divine laws and heritage. The attention given to Joseph's remains during this assembly is particularly evocative. The physical journey of Joseph's bones from Egypt to Canaan, as meticulously carried by Moses and then settled in Shechem, is laden with symbolic significance. This act fulfills Joseph's own prophetic words and serves as a tangible link between the past, present, and future of Israel. The burial of Joseph in the land purchased by Jacob not only honors Joseph's wish, but also reaffirms the deep roots and continuity of the Israelite claim to the land. 
This thread bears a striking resemblance to the Greek epic of the Argonauts, particularly the quest to retrieve the Golden Fleece. Just as the Argonauts sought to bring back the Fleece to appease the spirit of Phrixus, the Israelites carried Joseph's remains to honor his legacy and fulfill his last wish. Both narratives explore themes of returning home, honoring the dead, and fulfilling destinies. The closing of Genesis with Joseph's words, the end of Joshua with the burial of Joseph, and the mention of Joseph's offspring at the end of Numbers create a literary and thematic arc that spans generations. Joseph's story his posthumous return to Canaan resonates with the Homeric theme of Nostos, the hero's return journey. While Joseph himself does not return alive, his remains journey parallels Odysseus's long and arduous return to Ithaca. In both narratives, the return is more than geographical. It's a restoration of order, fulfillment of destiny, and reaffirmation of identity. Joshua, as Joseph's direct descendant, embodies this legacy. His leadership, the conquest of Canaan, and his own prophetic death at the age of 110 years, the same age as Joseph, reinforce the connection between them. This mirroring of lifespans is more than a coincidence. It's a literary device that binds the two figures together, symbolizing the continuation of a divine promise and mission. The biblical narrative, with its interweaving of personal stories and epic journeys, reflects a sophisticated literary picture. The parallels with Greek epics and platonic motifs are not mere imitations, but rather a dialogue between the cultures and narratives. The Bible's threads from the patriarchs to the kings, from individual destinies to collective history, are woven into a seamless garment, illustrating a complex, multifaceted understanding of human experience, divine interaction, and the quest for identity and belonging. This picture is not only a historical or religious document, but a profound literary and philosophical work that continues to resonate with universal themes and questions. Joshua's Ugaritic predecessor, Kiret. Let's embark on a scholarly yet sprightly journey through the ancient Ugaritic saga of King Kirit of Huber. Our story is etched on three venerable clay tablets. You can see the source. A narrative nearly complete save for some mysterious fragments lost to antiquity, penned by the scribe Ilimilku, I may have mispronounced that, in the waning years of the 13th century BCE. This epic begins with a powerful scene of Kirit engulfed in sorrow, lamenting the loss loss of his family. As Karit falls asleep, the deity El, a godly figure who also plays the dual role of Karit's paternal guide, appears in his dream. El inquires about Karit's deep sadness and offers him prosperity. Yet, Karit's heart yearns not for wealth, but for a lineage to continue his legacy. El, understanding the depths of Karit's desire, instructs him to present an offering and embark on a quest to Udom, the realm of King Pabil. There, after a week-long silent siege, Pabil is expected to offer treasures, but Karit is to request something far more valuable, Pabil's daughter, Huri. Karit, guided by El's words and assured by the backing of the god Baal, assembles a formidable force. They journey toward Udom, pausing at the temple of the goddess Athirat. Here, Karit, deviating from the divine script, makes a lavish pledge to Athirat, promising a fortune in silver and gold if his mission to claim hurry and to restore his family is successful. The Siege of Udom is a silent spectacle of strategy and patience. On the seventh dawn, as the city's uproar becomes unbearable, Pabil sends emissaries with offers of riches, which Karit strongly declines, demanding Hurry's hand instead. The agreement is struck, and Karit departs victoriously with his new bride. However, as time passes, the shadow of an unkept vow to Athirat looms over Karit. During preparations for a celebratory feast, he is struck by a mysterious illness, casting a shadow over the kingdom. The land withers, mirroring its king's plight. Desperate for divine intervention, heavenly messengers are dispatched, but the gods remain silent until El, moved by the situation, conjures a healing goddess. 
Restored to health, Karit attempts to host the banquet anew, yet domestic turmoil brews as his eldest son Yasib, anticipating his father's demise, boldly declares his intent to ascend the throne. Enraged and betrayed, Karit bestows a curse upon Yasib, echoing the depth of his earlier sorrows. Thus, the third tablet concludes our epic, leaving us to muse upon the interplay of divine intrigue, human ambition, and the unforeseen consequences of promises both made and forgotten. The parallels between the stories of King Karit at Udom and Joshua's conquest of Jericho have been noted by scholars for some time, and a closer examination reveals even more intriguing similarities. Both narratives are structured around a significant seven-day journey to their respective destinations, with each journey separated into two distinct phases. The first half culminates in a pivotal cultic event, followed by the remaining days leading up to a siege. In the biblical account of Joshua, the fourth day marks a critical moment with the crossing of the Jordan River, where the rituals are performed, the priest and the ark take center stage, and a memorial of stones is erected, Joshua 3-4. through This act is not merely a crossing, it signifies the beginning of the Israelites' entry into the promised land and the renewal of the covenant through the circumcision of all Israelite men from the desert generation. This renewal of the covenant is a solemn acceptance of divine law, the breach of which is almost immediately illustrated by Achan's transgression and soon punishment in Joshua 7. Similarly, in the Ugaritic story of King Karit, the midpoint of his journey is marked by a vow made at the temple of Athirat, who you can see the source, but that is also who later is named Asherah. This vow is not a mere formality, but a binding commitment that holds significant future implications, much like the Israelites' renewal of the covenant. In both stories, the leaders assume a profound obligation to a deity, setting the stage for the events that follow, and underscoring the serious consequences of deviating from their sacred promises. These narratives, then, are not just about the physical journeys or military victory campaigns, but are deeply embedded with spiritual and covenantal themes. The seven-day journey, the critical midpoint event, and the ensuing siege are not just coincidental parallels, but reflect a shared cultural and religious motif that emphasizes the importance of divine favor and the severe repercussions of failing to uphold them. In the unfolding saga of King Karit, a striking parallel to Joshua's story emerges when Karit himself, rather than a secondary character, breaks a vow made during his journey. On the third day of his campaign, Karit pledges an offering to the goddess Athirat, a promise he later neglects. This oversight leads to severe consequences. He falls gravely ill and teeters on the brink of death, unlike Achan, whose breach of covenant leads to his and his family's demise. Karit's narrative takes a different turn. The god El intervenes, rescuing him from the brink and allowing him to recover from his negligence. This comparison highlights a contrast in divine mercy and the outcomes of broken vows within the two stories. As each story progresses beyond the seven-day journey, divine guidance comes into play, dictating the strategies against their respective cities. In Joshua's account, the Lord initially through a celestial messenger, provides detailed instructions for the siege of Jericho, Joshua 5, 13 through 6, 5. This divine strategy is revealed incrementally. Joshua first receives a general command, the full weight of which becomes clear as the narrative unfolds, particularly when he sp sends spies to Jericho and leads the Israelites across the Jordan. A later, more detailed directive outlines the exact procedures for Jericho conquest, which Joshua follows meticulously. Karit's divine instructions, on the other hand, are delivered in a single comprehensive dream from El before he sets out for Udom, encompassing both the journey and the siege. Unlike Joshua's two-stage revelation, Karit's guidance is a one-off comprehensive plan. Yet both leaders are given their directives from their respective deities, setting the stage for the actions that follow.
In the riveting accounts of Joshua and King Karit, each narrative unfolds with a strategic siege lasting six days, characterized by a conspicuous absence of conflict or noise. Joshua silently leads the Israelites in a daily march around Jericho, while Karit instructs his forces to encircle Udom quietly refraining from any military action. This period of anxious calm sets the stage for dramatic shift on the seventh day. As the seventh day dawns in both stories, an abrupt eruption of noise shatters the previous stillness. In Jericho, the air vibrates with the sound of horns and a collective shout from the Israelites culminating in the miraculous collapse of the city's walls. This roar signals Jericho's defeat and opens the door for Israel's continued conquest of the Promised Land. Similarly, in Udom, the seventh day is marked by an unexpected clamor, not from human voices or instruments, but from the restless animals within the city, disturbed by the prolonged siege. This noise prompts King Pabil to initiate negotiations, offering Karit riches which are firmly refused. Instead, Karit demands Pabil's daughter Huri, as previously divined by L. By day's end, Hurry emerges, ready to join Karit and fulfill the promise of a future dynasty. In both stories, these two sequences of seven days culminate in pivotal moments that shape the destinies of the protagonists and their people. For the Israelites, it's the acquisition of the promised land, a national triumph. For Karit, it's securing a wife and future heirs, a personal dynasty. The disruptive noise on the seventh day in each story serves as a decisive turning point, resolving the central issue and making the momentous nature of the event. The narratives of Joshua and King Karit not only mirror each other in duration, but also share a range of intriguing similarities, including the pivotal role of a woman emerging from the besieged city. In Karit's tale, the woman is Huri, a princess destined to fulfill Karit's desperate need for an heir. She willingly leaves her city to become his wife, subsequently bearing his children and securing his lineage. Conversely, in the book of Joshua, the woman is Rahab, a harlot with a keen awareness of the Israelites' divine backing. Rahab aligns herself with the Israelites by sheltering their spies, and as Jericho falls, she and her family are the sole survivors, integrating into the Israelite community and continuing her line among them. This transformation from princess to harlot in the respective stories might hint at a literary interplay, a subtle or intentional allusion from one story to the other, showcasing a fascinating narrative adaptation. Both Karit and Joshua are depicted as devout men honoring their deities, reaching a sanctuary at the midpoint of their journeys, leading vast numbers and serving different roles among their people. Joshua acts as a mediator between God and the Israelites, while Karit as a king and supposed son of El wields special influence over Huber's people. However, despite their evident prominence, they are not the ultimate focal point of their stories. Instead, the narratives spotlight the divinities orchestrating events from behind the scenes. The gods are the true protagonists, dictating the unfolding events, with Joshua and Karit as their dutiful executors. In both the stories of Karit and Joshua, gold and silver emerge as symbols of temptation and testaments to divine authority. In Karit's story, these precious metals are twice presented as gifts, first by the god El and later by the king Pabil of Udom. Karit, however, spurns these offerings as his heart is set on securing a lineage, not accumulating wealth. Conversely, in the conquest of Jericho, the Israelites encounter silver and gold, not as gifts, but as spoils of the city, designated for the Lord's treasury, not for personal gain. The narratives converge as they explore the consequences of mishandling these divine treasures. For Karit, 
His illness is a direct result of failing to honor his vow to Athirat, a vow entwined with the promise of silver and gold. Similarly, in Joshua's story, Achan's secret appropriation of these metals from Jericho leads to his and Israel's downfall at Ai, culminating in his execution. In both instances, the misuse or rejection of gold and silver, symbols of divine favor or decree, trigger severe repercussions, highlighting a theme where maternal wealth is intricately linked to spiritual obedience and the fragile human divine covenant. These stories collectively underscore the peril of placing material wealth above divine will and the profound consequences that such transgressions entail. What do these similarities mean? Confronted with the compelling parallels between the stories of Karit and Joshua, one is naturally drawn to seek an explanation beyond mere coincidence. Despite acknowledging that such an unlikely coincidence cannot be entirely dismissed, the first potential explanation posits a shared literary convention prevalent in the ancient Near East, a two-week narrative structure for describing the assault on a city. This pattern typically includes a week-long journey to the city, punctuated midway by a religious ceremony, followed by a week-long siege, culminating in a dramatic, noise-induced surrender or conquest on the seventh day. This framework is appealing and could certainly explain the structural similarities. However, the additional parallels, such as the breaking of a vow related to gold and silver offerings to a deity, Karit's unfulfilled promise to Athirat, and Achan's illicit taking of Jericho's spoils, and the presence of a pivotal woman from the besieged city, Hurry, in Karit, and Rahab in Joshua, suggest a closer connection than a generic narrative template. The second explanation ventures into the realm of literary emulation or illusion, suggesting that the book of Joshua might be referencing or drawing upon another work, be it Canaanite, Israelite, or another tradition altogether. This other work could be the Epic of Karit, a different version of the Joshua narrative, or an entirely distinct composition. The precise nature of this source or inspiration remains elusive, likely forever obscured by the sands of time. However, the intricate similarities between the two texts make a compelling case for intentional literary emulation, where the author or authors of Joshua might have been influenced by or sought to echo elements from the story of Karit, a related narrative, thereby enriching their own tell with layers of cultural and literary resonance. In the end, while definitive answers may elude us, the exploration of these similarities opens up fascinating dialogues about ancient storytelling, cultural exchange, and the complex interplay between different literary traditions. Connecting Literary Works in Antiquity In the grand narrative of human history, the intertwining tales of ancient literatures are as complex as they are captivating. Imagine, if you will, a grand picture of words and ideas weaving through time and space as the world's early cultures and nations brush shoulders and shared horizons. The dance of influence between Greek and Latin text is particularly well documented, shining brightly under the scholarly spotlight and illuminated further by a wealth of contemporary records. This relationship isn't just a mere chapter in history. It's a well-thumbed narrative enriched by modern academic fervor. Venturing further into this literary labyrinth, we encounter the profound impact of the ancient Near East on Greek literary tradition. Scholars like M. L. West have delved deep into the cultural cross-pollination, unveiling layers of indebtedness and inspiration. Meanwhile, fresh insights continue to emerge, with researchers like Mary Bakfarova adding new twists and turns to this already intricate story. Yet, as our scholarly lanterns cast light on these connections, many corridors remain shadowed, their secrets whispered but not yet fully understood. The interactions among other ancient literatures, while less documented, 
are no less fascinating. These enigmatic links, though faintly traced in the sands of time, are an undeniable testament to the rich interconnected world of our literary forebears. In the classical world of words and wisdom, the craft of literary derivation, emulation, and illusion shines through as sophisticated art. Consider the Roman poet Virgil, widely recognized as a master borrower who artfully wove the threads of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey into the very fabric of his Aeneid. Virgil's Aeneas, much like the wandering Odysseus, embarks on a journey that echoes the ancient epics, while his Georgics also reflect a rich tapestry of prior works. In this intellectual milieu, illusion emerges as a delicate dance of meaning and reference. For Virgil and his contemporaries, illusion was a deliberate act, a two-step tango of indicating something and implying something more. It's not just a nod to another work. It's an intellectual whisper, a secret shared between author and reader. The reader's recognition is crucial. Without understanding the reference, the illusion's sparkle fades into obscurity. It's a game of literary hide and seek, where finding the hidden reference adds layers of new meaning, transforming the text into something more profound, more intricate. Furthermore, illusion and emulation are inseparable partners in the classical world. While you might find illusion without emulation, the reverse is a rarity. Emulation, the ambitious desire to echo and exceed a predecessor, naturally draws upon illusion. Virgil didn't just borrow from Homer. He aspired to match and surpass him, creating a rich intertextual web that acknowledged his Greek muse while striving for his own Latin laurel. Even in the biblical book of Joshua, we detect this subtle art. The narrative's unexpected elements suggest allusions to other stories, like the tale of Karit, hinting at a complex literary backdrop. These allusions are not just decorative, they're functional, adding depth and resonance, highlighting similarities and underscoring differences. The suggestion of illusion here, as in many ancient texts, is tantalizing, though often unprovable. Yet the possibility of these layers of meaning invites us to consider the profound connections and conversations between texts across time and space. It's clear that the classical world was a vibrant forum of literary dialogue, where authors engaged with their predecessors through illusion and emulation, crafting works that resonated with echoes of the past while speaking boldly into the future. The practice of drawing upon and responding to earlier works through emulation and illusion appears to be a near universal phenomena in the sophisticated literary cultures of the world. However, it's crucial to recognize that while these techniques have been extensively studied within the context of classical Greek and Latin literature, their application might not universally fit the literary traditions of other cultures or times. This is particularly true of texts that predate or are contemporary with classical Greek works, such as much of the Hebrew Bible. While classical insights offer valuable frameworks for understanding potential literary connections, we must approach each text on its own terms, carefully considering the unique cultural and literary context it inhabits. The notion that the Hebrew Bible and other ancient Near Eastern texts engaged in literary emulation and delusion is not new. Scholars like Daniel Bodhi have posited significant connections between biblical texts and other ancient works. For instance, the book of Ezekiel shows possible links with the Akkadian poem of Era. Similarly, the Telemachy in Homer's Odyssey may inform certain elements in the apocryphal book of Tobit, which also displays connections with Genesis and Job. The histories of Herodotus, a seminal Greek work, seems to have influenced the primary history and the book of Daniel, which in turn echoes the story of Joseph and the book of Ezra. The intertextual nature of these ancient texts extends to the foundational stories of creation and the flood in the Bible, which many scholars believe were influenced by Mesopotamian narratives like the Gilgamesh epic. 
These biblical authors did not create in a vacuum, but rather engaged with and transformed existing stories, embedding them with their own theological and cultural frameworks. The use of familiar stories ensured that these new creations resonated with their audiences, weaving them into the broader tapestry of their times, cultural and literary traditions. This rich interplay of texts highlights the dynamic nature of literary creation in the ancient world, where writers engaged in a dialogue not only with their contemporaries, but also with the voices of the past. Emulation and illusion, then, are not merely literary techniques, but are profound expressions of the human desire to connect, converse, and contribute to the ongoing narrative of culture and understanding. The Verdict As we draw the curtain on this provocative journey through the twisting corridors of history and myth, it's clear that the story of Joshua and the conquest of Canaan stands on shaky ground. The stark absence of archaeological evidence and the compelling similarities with ancient Ugaritic and Greek myths paint a picture of a story not rooted in historical fact, but in literary invention. We've been led to believe in the solidity of this narrative, but today we stand at the crossroads of doubt and discovery, questioning the foundations of a story that has been passed down through generations. The journey doesn't end here, though. It's just the beginning of a greater quest for truth, a pursuit that you are a vital part of. Your curiosity, your questions, and your thirst for understanding are what drive us forward. By joining Myth Vision's Patreon and YouTube membership, you're not just supporting this channel, you're fueling a movement, a movement that dares to challenge the accepted, to unearth the buried truths, and to deliver hard facts with the relentless spirit of inquiry. So if you found yourself intrigued, inspired, or even incensed, don't let the conversation end here. Join us on Patreon and YouTube. Become part of a community that values rigorous research, open dialogue, and the unquenchable desire to know more. Together, we can continue to pierce through the myths and misconceptions, bringing to light the stories behind the stories. Thank you for watching, for questioning, and for journeying with us through the shadows of history. Until next time, keep seeking, keep questioning. Never settle for anything less than the truth. Join us, support us, and let's continue driving hard facts through these documentaries. Pick up a copy of Dr. Joshua Bowen's book. Your journey with myth vision is just beginning. And never forget, we are myth vision.